Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, right? 50-50 ball, I got to come down with it. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. Look, I'm going to be very honest. I'm going to bring in OB right off the top. I don't think I'm qualified to talk about Caitlin Clark's career, like where she stands in the pantheon of best players women college basketball players or just college basketball players ever because I've only watched her a handful of times. I didn't watch last night. I caught clips on Twitter and was following along with it, but I had other stuff going on. Uh, But I saw several posts that she's the greatest and most electrifying college basketball player in the history of college basketball. And I think that includes men and women. And I don't think I'm qualified to answer that, but I am qualified to have an opinion. It's Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour, presented by The Warehouse at CC Creations. I am David Nuno. He is Olin Buchanan. He's our Heisman Trophy voter, our columnist, and, of course, my buddy here in the morning. OB, I mean, I've that girl can shoot. She's she fantastic. Shoot. Yeah. And she is worth the conversation because of what I think the attention she has helped bring the game of women's basketball. No doubt. But when we're talking about the most electrifying, greatest college basketball players of all time. There's a dude named Lou Alcindor yeah. who won a bunch of championships mm-hmm. and revolutionized the game. Bill Walton, <laughs> also in the mix. MJ, with his two championships and game-winning shots. Like, I think you have to win a championship to be in the convers- that conversation. I'm not saying you have to win a championship to be the best ever per se, but if, if, you're, if you're using tally marks the championship versus non-championship if things are similar the tie goes to the championship yeah but to to me she's kind of like um the larry bird of the women's game uh larry now obviously iowa is a bigger university than indiana state but it you know the way i look at it is uh you know larry bird took one of the he was a phenomenal player, and he took one of the underdogs and led it among the, you know, for a couple of years among the best programs in the country. Home. Yep. Got them to the championship and, and where they lost to Michigan State, but it captured the imagination. Uh, and I can remember being old enough to watch uh, that Final Four. I think Indiana State beat Arkansas in the semifinals, and then. Uh, um, then lost to Michigan State, who I think lost to Notre. I mean, beat Notre Dame. I could be wrong on that, but anyway, um, uh, she. You know, I watched it. Uh, we knew our son was watching it in Baton Rouge, so we watched it. And uh, I mean, she was. She's amazing. She's phenomenal. And, yeah. And you know, what she did last night, among everything that impressed me, besides her shooting, was when the. Uh, when the defense got preoccupied and too many people were coming at her, she was really adept at finding the open, the open player and, and passing to him. So she had about, I don't know off the top of my head, it seems like she had 10 assists. It might not have been that many. It might have been a couple more. But uh, So j- just a phenomenal player. But here's what I don't get. Why isn't being – the greatest woman's player enough. And I don't know if she is. I mean, I mean Cheryl Miller was – Cheryl Miller was amazing. Um, Shamika Holsclaw. Holes, they've had several at Tennessee. Candace Parker. She, Di- I saw Diana Taurasi play at UConn. Cheryl and, Swoops. Cheryl Swoops. Uh, did uh, Diana Taurasi score at the level that uh, Caitlin Clark? No, but did she have to? 
No, you know, they, right. they had better teams around her. Um, and so you could make a, I, I would, you could make an argument for them. And I think that's why you hear people like Cheryl Swoops um, kind of uh, diminish some of Caitlin Clark's accomplishments. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to diminish it because – I think she is great. Right? She is. There's uh, no I'm question. watching her. It, it is actually fun to watch. And I don't think you have to win a uh, championship to be considered the greatest. But if things are close, like if things are close, I think the champ, the tie goes. For instance, um, if you're if you're debating LeBron versus yeah, not even Michael, Jordan. Kevin Durant. Or Kevin. Okay, oh, Durant's I mean, got what two? He's got two with the Warriors. LeBron wins that argument. Messi, Ronaldo. Messi won the World Cup. See, I don't. I never put that into it. Uh, like I think Jordan's better than LeBron just because it's Jordan. It's Jordan. But he did win the championship. But he did win six championships. But if you want to go by that, then you know Robert Ory's better than anybody. But I don't think he's been. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that's the only. Oh, B- Bill Russell. B- Bill right. Russell. Bill Russell. Yeah. Better. So uh, you're you're right, Bill Russell. But anyway. Um, like I saw Jay Williams, the guy on ESPN, yeah. uh, was saying, "Well, she's not, she's not great." Talking about Caitlin Clark, she's not great because she hasn't won a championship, and you have to win a champion. And and you know he's one of those guys that doesn't like to give a lot of credit to sure. to, to people that are getting a lot of uh, acclaim. Uh, and that's just you know that, that's just ridiculous. The fact of the matter is that's like saying Charles Barkley was never great. Oh, he's so great, you know. Allen Iverson was never great. Great. You know, you, you know, but I think there's great and then there's greatest, right? Yeah, and I think I think Caitlin Clark is definitely in the conversation of, of greatest and greatest women, absolutely. And why isn't that enough though? You know, why do they say, Oh, these greatest player ever? Because if you put Caitlin Clark and you know, this will make people mad, but if you put Caitlin Clark out there and had probably an average uh College player, maybe even a really, really good high school player, which if he's really good, that means he's going to play college. It's, it's not the same. So why isn't it enough to say she might be the greatest women's basketball player ever? Well, and even if you didn't go on the one-on-one matchup, right, to me, just looking at Kareem Lou Alcindor's uh-huh. resume is like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. did he revolutionize the game? Well, they uh, they outlawed – the dunk, they changed the rules to keep him from 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 dominating. It'd be like taking away her three point shot. Right. Sorry. Which, by the way, Pete Maravich didn't have. Right. And Pete's in the top five college basketball and, players and, ever. and played one less one less season, and was never on a good team. So look, I think Caitlin Clark might be the best women's basketball player ever. Might she might be. Again, Cheryl Swoops and I mean, yeah, Cheryl Swoops and Cheryl Miller and Tamika Holdsclaw and Candace Parker and Tamika Catchings and uh, so, but let me uh, ask you this: all those at Connecticut are going to argue this. The the thing that I think we can give Caitlin Clark, and maybe we're just in a different world because of social media. She almost has become must watch television, and I don't remember those players being must watch. I remember catching it on Sports. Well, that's why I say she's like the. The Larry Bird, right? Because it, it, as popular as the uh, NCAA tournament was, that that year elevated. Bird, it elevated it and then took it on into the NBA. At 100%. What I find is one of the most ridiculous things I've seen is how many WNBA players are already uh, jealous of her and say she's going to make you guys money. Yeah. You know, you're always complaining that you don't get a enough money or enough and it's because people don't watch well if people start watching then it makes sense that then your salaries will increase if people are watching and then salaries may increase because of her i would like to see her play one more year of college if she wins or doesn't i think that would be cool um, because i think i don't think they're gonna win i don't either i think south carolina south carolina is just but it'd it'd be cool to see though i'll root for them though yeah it would be cool to see. She's it. a great story. There's no doubt about it. What now, did, so, so with your son going to LSU, were you rooting for LSU or Caitlin Clark? Uh, the the wife was definitely rooting for LSU, and I'm just watching it. You know, I mean, I'm like, I'm just watching it for the 
for the sheer spectacle of it. Yeah, it, it felt like like I was the, the guy who wasn't invited to the party because I wasn't watching. Mm-hmm. I, was ca- I was following along. You know, Casey Smith was tweeting. Everybody was tweeting about it, right? Like, I was following along that way, but I was, I was doing dad stuff, so I, I did not put it on. I caught a lot of the re- uh, highlights that were on Twitter, and, you know, I saw people's reaction to some of her threes, and then whenever they well, would try to double her. Range. Yeah, she she she's she incredible. has quick release and good range, and she's able to uh, – She's able to get her shot without necessarily having to. I notice a lot of women that will get the ball and they take their shot. They kind of line their whole body up, kind of yeah. bring it to the to the shoulder, and then shoot. And she's able to do it all in one motion. She is. She's great. Who was your Who is your favorite college basketball player? Like that you watch? Not the best, just the one that you re- really enjoyed watching. Oh gosh, um, is there one? Larry, maybe. Uh, no, no, not Larry, because I was rooting for Magic in Michigan State in that game. Uh, who did I really like? Uh, probably, I would probably say uh, Clyde Drexler. Really? Well, I, got right, I got it right into that five nice slam a jamma that yeah. year, and that was so much fun. And, yeah, so and he had a great, good personality. Yeah, and, and, and Akeem was really good, but he wasn't – he wasn't the – the, the greatest player on that team, in my opinion. The next year he was when Clyde he, moved on right. to the NBA. Um, so, yeah, th- that comes to mind. Okay. Clyde Drexler comes to mind. Um, Mine was Larry Johnson. Okay. I loved UNLV. That yeah. shouldn't surprise yeah. you. Like that's, no, he was a yeah, he, he Dallas fun. guy. So I, Grandmama was so much fun to watch. Well, he wasn't Grandmama yet. No, but he became the Grandmama. Yeah, yeah. he did. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I really liked, I liked watching Larry Johnson. That UNLV team with Stacey Ogman and – what was got Anderson? Did you like Hunt? Bobby Hurley? No, I didn't. Yeah, I, he was kind of a pest. Uh, I didn't dislike him. Yeah. Um, Rex uh, Chapman. No, no, no. I never liked. I've never liked Kentucky ever. Yeah. Um. Uh. Never. Did you like Alonzo Mourning back in the day? I liked Patrick Ewing. Okay. I did like Patrick Ewing because you know he was the first guy to wear the undershirt. Yeah. And uh, he was so good. But then I started hating Georgetown. Um, gosh, that's a good question. I, I, See, for me, I remember look, my favorite basketball player of all time was Charles Barkley, but I don't remember him at Auburn. I do. Uh, but in the NBA, I remember him Sixers rookie year. That's that's how I became. And I had the white leather ball that they made of Barkley. He's still my, my favorite. This can't be my favorite, but I have to admit that there was a time when I got into LSU when I was in high school because they were fun. Oh. Uh, no, before Shaq. Uh, and they had a guy named Rudy Macklin. Okay. Durant Macklin. I remember I liked to watch him. But um, and, and it seems like so many of the guys that I was impressed with, like Sidney Moncrief, I didn't want him to win. Sidney Moncrief at yeah. Arkansas, boy, he was good. You know, but the reason I bring that up is there was a time where all college basketball – I liked Bill Walton. Did you really? Yeah, because yeah. the first game I ever saw was Bill Walton uh, – Score, uh, making 21 or 22 shots in the championship against Memphis. And then they came back the next year, and he was really good, but they lost to NC State, which had David Thompson. Yeah. Um, so I, but I keep coming back to Clyde Drexler. The reason I ask about it is because there was a time where college basketball players in my world were household names because people would stay a couple – even if they stayed two years, right? And now I don't feel like it's the same way with the international game taking off and with players going to the NBA after a year or so. I miss the days of knowing a team that you knew you could. And by the way, there are some teams built like this. Houston is built with people who have been there for a while. Like A&M, hello, players who have been here for a while. But I miss that being most of I think my all-time favorite A&M player was Joe Wilbert. Okay. I, of course, I was covering him that year. But I saw him come down from Tyler Junior College. So I was up in Tyler the year before, and I saw him play. And I and I and to this day, I think if Joe Wilbert had been three inches taller, that he had had a 10-year, 15-year career in the NBA. But I really liked him. And I liked that he knocked out that guy, and uh, that fan in, at Texas Tech that was, that was trying to fight his coach. And Joe came over. You would have loved this, Dave. He came over. He hit – there was three guys, and they were costing – Tony Brony on the floor. Yeah. Joe came over, and he hit this guy right between the eyes. I mean, I saw it. I was as close as I am to Luke Evangelist. And I saw a guy who was unconscious on his feet. Okay. And when he felt his knees never buckled. He went back like a, like a tree being cut down in the forest. Just boom. boom. It was, 
and, and afterwards, I was talk, talking to Joe in the locker room. He said, "Yeah, look, I got I hurt my knuckle, and he had a cut on his knuckle for him." But J- Joe was a great player. Um, yeah, I think my favorite Aggie player of all time might be Joe Wilbert. He builds homes now. Does he really? Yeah, he needs to build me one. <laughs> if, if you want to be a part of the conversation this morning, you can do it multiple ways. 979-693-1150 is the phone number to call the show. You can also text the show at that number. Of course, you can tweet at us. We try to look at that from time to time. Let's uh, go around the room and say hello to the people. We go behind the glass. We say hi to Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy. Good morning, y'all. What's up? Well, big road test tonight for Aggie baseball and a good mid mid major too. The the Texas State Bobcats, you know, their record. I think they're fifteen and thirteen. Uh, but I mean, a little a little deceptive on the record because they're they're a good ball club and uh, you know, it's it, I think uh, it was Schloss yesterday who said that they're gonna they're gonna pack that place out because it's number three team in the country coming in there and uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see I'm excited to see how Luke Jackson does as well on the road. Big. I think might be his first uh, road start, so we'll see how it goes. Hope so. Hope we see some uh, some big things tonight. That's a big game. It's a big midweek game. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a, uh, a like like Nick said, a good a good program, and kind of likes you know a, who doesn't like a, a trip over to San Marcos even in in the middle of the week. Outlet Mall. I bet you're an outlet mall. Guy. No, I wasn't an outlet mall. I can see you like just no, shopping the for wife, sunglasses. The wife would. I would look miserable. Versus. If I was with her, but uh, I like San Herbert's Taco Hut. That's a good place That's to go. That's legit, and uh, if it's still there, and I just was the type more of the hanging, especially in the summertime, hanging around the San Marcos River. Is Irma the type of person that when she goes shopping, something that should take nine minutes takes uh, nine hours? She cannot understand why spending hours just leafing through things that you never intend to buy. I hate that. She doesn't understand why I don't find great. Joy, joy in that. I don't. I'm either. like, oh God, please just just peel my skin off one layer at a time. My wife loves to look at houses that we're never gonna buy. Like she, we'll be driving in our neighborhood, she'll go, I'm gonna put up H A R or whatever that has the and like, oh, let's look at this house. Your honey. wife and my wife should hang out. Yeah, and you know what I think? And then we go like I don't know, fishing or something. Any, anything, 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 but, anything but, but but paint dry. Shopping. Shopping. Oh, God. Paint dry. Shop. Mm, At I'm least paint dry. my feet don't hurt watching the paint dry. <laughs> Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. That's where we find Luke Evangelist. Luke, good morning, buddy. Good morning, y'all. So y'all know I love Twitter, and I need to share something with you that I found. Uh, I wasn't able to watch the Iowa LSU game, but I was following along on Twitter, and Twitter was absolutely incredible. I saw a tweet that said, Caitlin Clark must be from the Washington Post because Kim Mulkey has no answer for her. Uh, and I got a that, great kick out of that. That's pretty good. By the way, that was a nothing burger. That, I heard. I heard about it. I heard Feinbaum talking about it. And, I mean, it wasn't nice, but it wasn't like, I thought it was going to be this expose. They were going to come up with something yeah. that's, oh my gosh. You know, she, this girl woman is terrible. Yeah. I mean, I mean, she is. You just, there's just, I just, the article was the article, but we know we don't need an article to tell us how to feel about Kim Mulkey. <laughs> Wasn't there the LA Times? If she was your coach, you would article? love her. Uh, I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, you would. I, I yeah, think you I would. Because she's her. winning championships. You're Mr. Aggie. You would love her. If she's your coach, you love her. You'd I like Joni Taylor way more. Give I'm her not a- saying you, yeah, you love Joni Taylor because she's your coach. And Joni definitely uh, conducts herself differently. But if she's your coach and she's winning championships, for, what has she won? Four national championships yes. in her career? If she's your coach, you love her. Look, I'm, I'm the only one in America that likes Draymond Green. But if Draymond Green plays for your country, if Patrick Beverly uh, plays for your team, excuse me, you love them. They're your guys. Yeah, the only person that I can ever think of that pay, played for, you know, represented like the United States or a team that I like that I, that I didn't like. Who's that? Uh, what's the, the blue-haired uh, girl from, uh, yeah. from Subway? Yeah. <laughs> So I don't eat what? Subway anymore. So I think she was a spokesperson for Subway. I yeah. don't like her. So I rooted against. It's the only time I've ever rooted against you know one of my teams. Rapino. Yeah, Rapino. Did you know how I feel about rap? You're a big rap guy, but that's the, that's where I you draw the rap. line. Yeah. If somebody say, are, rap? are, you, are no. you rapping? No. I knew that was coming. <laughs> what else, Luke? While we're on the topic of Caitlin Clark, Fred <laughs> in College Station texted in, and I agree with him. He said Caitlin Clark's legacy is cemented as one of the best to play the game. If she doesn't win a championship by losing to a better team in South Carolina, it doesn't take away what she's done in the sport 
and for the sport to grow uh, the women's game. Yeah, but who does she? She has one more game before that, right? Yeah, they just got to the final four. So. They've got UConn and <laughs> yeah. UConn. Oh, is, did UConn beat USC last night? Yeah, I went to bed. And USC was expected to win, right? I, I don't know. Yeah, USC was the one seed. Both teams, I think, phenomenal players like Paige Beckers and Juju Watkins. The game is definitely growing. It's not just Caitlin Clark, but I think she's like the, the leader. The thing is, of the they're path. saying that, but they've they've always had big time players. It's yeah. the, they just they were always at UConn and Tennessee. I, I look for the most part. I am not saying this about women's basketball. I'm saying this in general. Social media makes you feel like you're supposed to like things. A lot of things. Certain <laughs> movies. Let, let like, me, oh, you got to watch Roadhouse. Roadhouse sucked. Sorry, the new one. Yeah. You know what? I hope. Uh, you know, it, I always say if, if it cre- it, it's up to the w- women's game. And maybe Clay, Caitlin Clark and some of those players are going to make a difference. But it's I, the, the coach at Ole Miss this year was complaining about people not coming to – to their games, and as if you know yeah. you're misogynist or you're this. If you don't, if you don't come in, no, it's up to you to create a product that is so good that people come to it. Sure, and that's what Caitlin Clark has done, and Iowa has done. I give them that. And by the way, if you have a vested interest in something, then yeah, it's like I can watch my kids' t-ball game when they were five years old and think it's a big deal. Yeah, I'm totally invested in all the players, not just my kid. Like when there's an interest. It raises the value up, and I think that's why it's been great to have eyeballs on these games. <laughs> and and I, I hope more people will will follow sports, but it's it's up to them. And and is is there going to be as much interest in uh, women's college basketball next year without Caitlin Clark? I think that's a legitimate question. Yeah, yeah, good question. Let's do this. Let's hit a break. We'll get back to Luke here in a moment. Let's hit a break. We'll come back with our performance of the week. Right now, career opportunities in Aggieland, yeah, you should call up the Association of Former Students because they're looking for great people to go work for them. Uh, They're seeking to hire professionals to join their team right now. There are positions open all over the place, but I'll I'll highlight a few. Fundraising and uh, former student programs and much, much more. They're the nation's leader, uh, alumni association, and oldest organization serving this A&M network here, the Aggie Network. They play a part in every Aggie story from Howdy to here. So don't miss opportunities to help out with these great, great events like Howdy Socials, Aggie Reen Day, Class Reunions, Aggie Muster, and everything in between. I want you to join a team that exemplifies the Aggie core values, excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service, all in support of that worldwide Aggie network. Uh, you can, if you're interested, join the team right now by doing uh, something, going to the website, by doing something that is great English, tx.ag slash association jobs, tx dot ag slash association jobs to apply and get more information on each position it's the association of former students
Welcome back into the Go Hour presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. Maroon never looks so good with Maroon You. It is Tech Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's uh, do our performance of the week, and I, I'm going to start things off, Ob, with one that I actually didn't put on here, but I should have put on here. Have you been watching Alex Caruso's act recently? I haven't. I haven't seen a lot of NBA. So on the 31st, which I guess was Saturday, Sunday? Sunday? Saturday? Yeah, Sunday. Sunday. He went 7 of 8 from three-point line. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, he scored 21 points in that game. He also had five rebounds, five assists. Um, and then just uh, yesterday against the Atlanta Hawks, he did not shoot great. He did hit two three-pointers, but had uh, three. He had two steals, two blocks, five rebounds, and uh, he hit two of seven three points. He was on a Lakers team that won the, the championship. The championship. The last and, time the Lakers won. Yeah, and, and, and they've like struggled just to get into the playoffs. Yeah. And they still have Davis. Yeah, and LeBron. And I think we see who the key was on that, on that team. AC is the guy, no doubt about that. So props to Alex Caruso. OB, I'm going to let you do the next one. You choose. Who do you I, want on there? You know, d- don't, I ha- don't, I have to, don't you have to take Braden Montgomery? The SEC uh, Player of the Week? Yeah. Well, didn't we talk about yesterday? Like yeah. 7 of 14, yep. four home runs. See, I'm not even looking at the – You know it. 7 of 14 – uh, four, home four home runs, seven RBI. Got a big double, scored the game winning run in in game three. Well, I want just, you to look at these stats. Just, these are this week, just this week. All around general studliness. Four eleven, four homers, eight bar RBI, eight runs scored, four walks. Is he good at baseball? He's good at baseball. Yeah, I think he's. Man, you got a. I don't know what else can he give. Give me something else with uh, eight runs scored, eight RBIs. Four walks, four home runs. That's not a season. What else can you do? That That's in a week. That looks like a full house. Jesse Kasophilus. I'm thinking eights and fours. Oh, okay. You, know. you weren't thinking about thinking like poker. Bob Saget. I, I I don't think about Bob Saget very often. Okay. Maybe when I'm depressed. Uncle Jesse. The I didn't really watch the show. Oh, I've heard show. of the Olsen twins. They were like little babies then. Right? Yeah, but now they're like like they own companies. Yeah. They're business icons, apparently. Huh. Um, let's do Mr. Consistency is the next one. Are you familiar with Evan Oshenbeck? I am. I am. He's from Brenham. He is. Look at those stats right there. Uh, four innings pitched on Thursday. Uh, he had the five strikeouts, the one run Saturday. Comes in and helps him out, obviously, at, at the very end. he Every time he comes out there, you can count on him. You really feel that way, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, he comes in. and I'm, Did he give up a home run? This week, I believe he did on Thursday. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, he, so he's not, so he's not perfect. He he is human. He's he's our kind of perfect. But he is he is a. You just feel good when he comes in the human. game. Oh, when he comes in, I'm thinking, okay, whatever the situation is, you know, if there's a fire, uh, you know, it's put out. Right. Exactly. Exactly that. Hey, uh, Luke Evangelist, why don't you give us uh, the next one? Absolutely. We're going to go Sam Whitmarsh from Texas A&M Track and Field. Indoor season is over. They're running outdoors. And I would imagine that you run faster when you run outdoors. Well, OB, I mean, you might move at the same speed both ways. But, uh, yeah, I would assume wind helps. And it definitely helps Sam. It can hurt, too. Well, okay, hold on. If you're running and, yeah, I guess half the time it helps, half the time it hurts. Yeah, well, and if it's run behind you, then what, what all of a sudden it, your numbers what if it's a crosswind? don't count. Oh, if it's crosswind, I didn't account for that. Yeah, Hold see, on. See, we need they, the engineers back in here to No, you to just need to out. know civilization and life and atmosphere. It's actually very simple to figure this out. Okay. Where's Matthew when you need him? Right, exactly. We need Matthew to calculate it. Anyways, the wind was helping Sam in his debut in the 800. He ran 144.46, which is the fastest time in college athletics right now. This season, the season did just start, but I'm going to assume it's going to hold for a minute. His mark was the second all-time on A&M's all-time list, the eighth fastest time in NCAA history, and the number four mark in the entire world. He's the fourth fastest person. I'm sorry, did I, did I miss it? Did you say what the event was? 800. 800, yeah. 800 meters. Yeah, and Kay Nagley asked if I could run it in, what did she say yesterday? Like, in less than five minutes. Oh, for oh, sure. For, you could yeah. probably do it in, like, 210. No, heck no. Yeah. No, I'm... I'm like right now, without training, I'd four twenty-one. Now you do probably three minutes. I know I can't. Maybe I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. It's been so long. Ob four minutes. Four <laughs> minutes. Four minutes would be it. It would be uh, if if my hamstring doesn't pull. Yeah. It would be it would be possible. But because when you used to run, you used to run like an eight minute mile, right? 
oh, I did better than that when I ran. Yeah. And my, like I said, in, in high school, my. No, I'm talking about coach, it like your old man. No, days. I know. I know. Yeah. yeah, I could, I could do better in eight minutes when Luke, I ran. Luke, what do you think? OB, you could probably do 80 meters in four minutes. I don't know about 800 meters. All right. How much money you want to put in? <laughs> this is what I love about the show when this happens. 80, I got, I got 80 meters and I got four minutes to do it. I, mean, I could crawl that. <laughs> Luke, what do you think you could do it in? Oh, probably three, three minutes. No, what? I could do it in, in. I used to run cross country in high school. Yeah, that's four so, years ago. Okay, it's in my blood. It's in my genes. I'm not that out of shape. I didn't say David. you were. But every time we try to bring something up to do, you're like, you know, I got class. It's I Sunday do have class. Look, if, if we're going to schedule this, you got to check in with my calendar. Make sure I can even fit you in. If we're going to do this, it's going to be an all-day affair. I'm going to need to take the entire day to, do to a rub half it mile? in. No, to rub in that I'm faster than you. Oh, you are faster than me. I'm not saying David, that. he's got his, his track highlights on his huddle, too. <laughs> he's he's got with that with his, his basketball, basketball highlights. Yeah, 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 go check those out. Hey, uh, for the record, you are faster than me. Thank you. You're the fastest one to get thrown out of this building. He's, what are you, 20? 21? Yeah. He should 20, be faster than a 50-year-old man. Yeah. In fact, if it should be, if you're uh, double his age, yep. you, the race should be you got to finish like twice as fast because he's twice as old. No, you know what? No. You, you, you tell me the time you need me to hit that you can guarantee you hit, and I'll, and I'll train for it. Okay. I could probably run – a mile in the same time that it takes you to run like 1,200 meters, like three-fourths of a mile. So you think you can run a mile in how many minutes? Just tell me. Probably 7.30, probably 8. I just told you I'll do a mile in 8.20. Okay, well, then it's a real it's race. Game over. <laughs> Nobody's listening anymore. We lost everybody. Oh. Thanks, Luke. Way to go, buddy. We'll hit a break here. We'll come back with Shereen Williams. But right now, it is time to talk about... Heritage Films, that's Chance McLean's company. They've been around for a few years now. Chance decided to start this business way back when he was talking to Michael Berry, who's a talk show host in Houston. And Michael Berry's father was uh, getting ill, and, and he wanted to make sure we captured his story, right? And, the, and he called Chance up, like, look, man, I, I know you don't do this, but you do film. Is there any chance you could do my dad's story? And we'll capture it, and we'll tell it. So Chance did it. And he fell in love with the process. He's like, man, I love doing this. I love getting to know your family story. I love telling it. I love putting it together. So he started doing it. And then lo and behold, Aggies all over the place were calling him. Chance, I want a video. I want a video. And it became his business and it became his passion. He's the most creative guy I know. He does documentaries. He does movies. Red carpet shows. Started a radio station. A good old boy. Daughter went to A&M. He's just awesome. And I highly recommend you give Chance a phone call. And he's also got the YearFlix option, which is basically a 20-minute video that he can do for families as well or for kids, right? And it's Q&A style, and it's going to be one of those you can do a benchmark video. Find out about sixth grade, find out about eighth grade, find out about your freshman year in high school. He's the best at it. The website is yourheritagefilm.com, 713-893-8341, yourheritagefilm.com, 713-893-8341.
One of your favorites? Um, yeah, it's a good song. Yeah. Cross my heart. Hey, it's Tex-Tex Radio. You knew that, right? Yeah. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. You we knew are. that. Yeah. yeah. And we're in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you knew that. Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse of CC Creations. I knew that as well. Did you know Shereen Williams was on the hotline? I did. Yeah. And, she, you know, she's from Pro Football Talk, and she also is a Hall of Famer. Yeah, she's from Orange, Texas. And she's our friend. Absolutely. And she's on the show. Shereen, good morning. Good morning to you guys. How are we doing today? We're great. How are you? I'm fantastic. How much? Uh, better. How much attention did you pay to that uh, Iowa LSU game last night? Uh, a lot. Yeah. I, what an amazing game! I mean, it was fantastic basketball. It was fun. The outcome was great. Obviously, uh, sorry, Ola. And uh, yeah, just just pretty much enjoyed enjoyed that. That's my favorite game of the tournament uh, to watch. It was fantastic. <laughs> Shereen, LSU losses do not affect me negatively. <laughs> Just want you to know. <laughs> uh, you know how much that did for for women's college basketball. I, I can't wait to see what the ratings were for that game. But I just, I think it took it to another another level. And I think we're going to see. I think we're going to see the women outdraw the men. So, I mean, part of it is they're on regular TV and the men are on the other. But it, it, the women's game has just grown so much exponentially over the last two or three years. Caitlin Clark's been a big part of that. Angel Reese has been a big part of that. You, you start, like, I, I don't know how many men, other than AM and players, I'm excluding them, but other than A&M players, I don't know how many men's basketball players, like, I could name right now. I, I don't know the names, but I do know the names in women's basketball. And it's not like I follow women's basketball the whole entire year. I follow A&M women's basketball, but... You know, it's not like I sit and watch games and stay home and make it a part of my regular routine. If I'm there, I might turn it on. But my point is, even if you don't follow it, like, you know Kate and Carton, you know Angel Reese, you know, you know all, all players from, from the other team. But I don't have that same feel for the men's game, and, and I think that's great for women's, women's basketball. Well, my question would be, if Iowa loses – in the first round of the S of the yeah. of the final four. Yeah. What's the what's the interest level for the championship game? If it's Caitlin Clark's not there's in. no question about that. Yeah, the, it, it's less. There's no question about that. If she's there then then I think it's bigger. You know, people people will watch and see what she's gonna do. I mean, that performance last night, I compare it to whoever you want to compare it to and whatever sport you want to that was big time. To rise to that level and play like that, it's like whenever they needed a basket, Ellen, she's, she's like, okay, uh, enough of that, boom, you know, enough of that, boom. And, and it's just, it, it was Michael, Michael Jordan-esque, um, you know, wh- whoever you want to, you know, Patrick Mahomes-esque, whatever player, whatever sport you want to compare her to, That that's what it was like. I mean, it was that great of a performance. But you're right. If she's not there for people to get excited to, to watch that, what is she going to do tonight? Then, then I do think it will be less of a draw. Shereen, I think it was last week that you wrote about Mike McCarthy insisting he doesn't feel pressure to do more with less. Um, to explain that because yeah. I, I think this is a – maybe I'm wrong, OB, but I feel like this is a make-or-break year as last year felt like it should have been. Well, he did him no favors. We were in Orlando last week for the NFL – Owners meetings, and obviously we had all the rules changes, and which is going to be interesting with the kickoff um, was one thing they did. But yeah, the coaches all talked at the at the thing, and you know, Mike McCarthy said that you have pressure every year as as a head coach was the basic premise of what he said. I, and I get, I understand that there is pressure every year for for head coaches, but it's extraordinary pressure. It's more pressure, whatever word you want to use, when you're in the final year of your contract. And the GM of the team has not done anything to help you. In fact, you're significantly worse talent-wise than you were the previous season. So, you know, I, I, I feel bad for Mike McCarthy because he's had 12 consecutive, 12, three consecutive years of 12 wins, which is the first time the Cowboys have done that since the 1990s. It should have brought him a contract extension. Instead, as Jerry always does, he's making him play out the contract every assistant coach on that staff is in the final year of his contract so they're fighting for their jobs not knowing where they're going to be next year 
And, and it's just a difficult working environment, in my opinion. Now, we'll see. But they are walking on a tightrope because with McCarthy in the last year of his contract, this is the coaches in the last year of their contract, Dak Prescott in the last year of his contract, you need to extend Micah Parsons and CeeDee Lamb. This whole thing is a tinderbox, and it could go up in front. If they start out, let's just say, four and five or whatever it is, this thing could blow up on them, and it could be just a really horrible year. So we'll see if it pays off. Jerry thinks that play, playing coaching under pressure brings out the best in you. Or we'll find out if that's accurate. I do think they let Dak play out his contract. Uh, there's no reason at this point, frankly, to extend it. I mean, the point to extend it was to have money to spend in free agency. Free agency's over. There's nobody left to sign. And so you wait and see what you get in the draft, and then you go sign the leftover free agents. I do think they'll end up signing Ezekiel Elliott as a backup running back to Jonathan Brooks or whoever they end up drafting at running back to be a starting running back. But, you know, it, it's just going to be it, it's going to be a difficult situation, in my opinion, that they put Mike McCarthy in to try to win and save his job with, with a team that's not as good as the one that lost to Green Bay in the wild card round of the playoffs. Um, you know, they let uh, Tyron Smith walk. Um, was that a good move? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think they could have come to an agreement with him where he would have stayed. He would have taken something of a hometown discount. He did last time. And, and the money is not significant. Now, <clears throat> I think it's a $6 million base salary if memory serves, and then he's got incentives up to $20 million. It, Come on. He, Jerry said, oh, it's the incentives. I'm worried about He's not playing 17 games. He hasn't played 17 games since 2015, I think. And it's been a long time. He's not going to play 17 games. He's banged up. <clears throat> but I would want Tyron Smith as my left tackle, as well as he played last year, and hope that, that I had him at the right time uh, to protect my quarterback. I, I, I don't know. I, I, would have, I would have made that work. I would have given him that one-year deal. Everybody else is on one-year deals. But again, they would have had to find the money to, to make that work. To me, it really feels like this team is in a soft tank. And by a soft tank, that, that they're going to let it play out and see what happens. And if they get to the playoffs and they win a game, they get to the divisional round, championship game, whatever, um, then, then they bring everybody back. They sign Dak to an extension. They bring Mike McCarthy back. They bring the assistants back whichever ones want to come back, because, of course, at that point they can leave. That's the danger you risk, because they can all leave. Dak Prescott could choose to leave. And then if they don't, let's say it's a bad year, they don't make the postseason, or make the postseason a loose game in the wild card round, whatever, however that works out, then I think they go, you know what, let, let's just let's, let's start over. Let, let's get a new head coach. Let's get a new quarterback. Trey Lance could be the quarterback. I'm not going to pay much money for Trey Lance. Start over on our salary cap. We'll have plenty of money. We'll build around them, and and that's what we'll do. I to me, that's what it feels like they are doing. Whether that's actually their thought process, I don't know. But that's what it feels like they're doing at this point. Is a soft tank. Let's see how this plays out. If it's good, great. Sign everybody. If it's not, we're going to move on and start over. Shereen, last thing for you. Uh, legally, the NFL in an interesting week. You got the Cameron Sutton situation, and obviously the uh, the Rice yeah. legal issues that happened there in the Metroplex. Yeah, and the Rasheed Weiss one is interesting because videos keep surfacing and and photos, and now we have the lawyers saying that the Lamborghini is leased to Rasheed Rice. It looks like both cars were either owned or leased by him at this point. He still hasn't turned himself in. He retained Royce West. Uh, as his attorney, who says he will cooperate. I'm not sure what cooperate means when you haven't turned yourself in or talked to police, but that's kind of where we are uh, in that case. And the problem for the Chiefs is, I mean, this is a serious matter. I mean, you, you see them walking away, and according to the, the Cowboys uh, website guy who's employed by the team, it was a bunch of SMU players that he's walking away with. So I think SMU's probably got a, a, a problem on its hands as well. Um, based on what Nick Harris from, from uh, the Cowboys website said. Um, so, you know, we'll see how this plays out. But from the Chiefs' standpoint, like he's 
going to be their number one receiver. Like he kind of was this past season, but he really was going to be in his second season. They signed Hollywood Brown to be the number two receiver. So you really need him and uh, the entire season, and, and you don't know how it's going to play out. Is your number one receiver going to be there all the season? He's going to be there part of the season. He's not going to be there at all. Like how's this thing going to work out? Now I, I think he's there. You know, I think he's probably going to serve some type of suspension. The question is going to be probably how long is that suspension going to be and when is it going to come? You know, the way these things play out, these investigations, it may be, you know, a year from now before we hear of of any kind of suspension. But I do think we probably will hear about a suspension at some point. I think he he will have to serve that. and The Chiefs will be without him for a while, which is, again, problematic for them with the receiver core is not very good. Shereen, great stuff as always. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Shereen Williams there on the hotline. All right, we'll uh, we'll hit a break here. We'll come into the last segment, answer some text messages, and get some final thoughts here on the Go Hour as uh, we'll continue on here on Texags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. My good buddy, Felipe, is listening to the show, disappointed that we'd started with women's basketball, not the Astros no-hitter last night, or the Rangers semi-scuffle or whatever almost happened with Garcia yesterday. I guess they, they hit him towards the end of the game or whatever. Mm. Uh, they hit George Young, and now he's out for a while with a broken wrist. Is that right? Yep. Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, the Astros no-hitter, big deal. But I think yesterday the, the story – was that, and that's why we, we took it a different direction of 
Like there's to me, there's a lot of dudes that are in the conversation for the most electrifying, best college basketball players we've ever seen. A lot of guys. Yeah. Yes. Dudes, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. And a few women. Yeah. Yeah. But I wouldn't put them at Lou Alcindor's level. I wouldn't put them at no. Mike's level. I wouldn't put them at P- a Pistol Pete. And again, it shouldn't matter. Look, uh, are you the best at what you do yep. with, against your competition? You know, I'm disappointed to hear Mike Tyson isn't allowed to fight Jake Paul now. I guess he didn't pass whatever the boxing commission didn't approve him. Oh. Huh. Because he's your age. You think uh, You think maybe this Paul guy paid somebody off to... I don't know. I mean, if, if a dude is on steroids and is 25 years old, he should be able to beat up even an older yeah, I would Mike take, Tyson. Yeah, I would take Mike Tyson. Did you watch his last fight? I did not. I guess Roy I Jones, take, he didn't look good. I'd still take him. Yeah. Would you take Roy Jones versus Jake Paul? I don't know Roy Jones. I mean, I'm, I remember a name, didn't watch him. Oh, he was so his, good 30 but years ago. Probably if you were a professional yeah. fighter. You know, the steroids make you a better fighter. I mean, it hurts more when they punch you. And when you're old and slow, so, it hurts more. Yeah. Luke, uh, uh, I know you're a Rangers guy. Did you pay attention to the Astros no-no last night? Yeah, my friends were texting about it, and I'm just like, okay, good for y'all. We'll see what happens hey, in the hey, playoffs. Let, that's not what we're talking well, about. You're though. already looking to October. <laughs> look, look, no, uh, I just— I mean, no hitters should be celebrated. That's one of the— the times that I know that still to this day, when you see one on your timeline, you go, let me check out these last few innings. People do that. That's yeah, fair. But you know what? Um, Regardless of the opponent. See, some it, of us are classy amazing. with our rivals. It's David, amazing. did you know that the Astros are responsible for four of the last six no-hitters in Major League Baseball? Must be the trash can. Must be, right? I mean, it's got to be. You hit the nail right on the head, David. That's I mean, what I course. was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I always give props to the Rangers. Some of us can be adults and mature about rivalry. Some of us can be little kids that are trying to get jobs in big com- companies. And, and failing? <laughs> no. They were ascending, and now they're failing. They were. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. We, we are redoing our whole intern posse. So, mm. Hey, oh, sorry, Luke. Hello? <laughs> OB, great hour, buddy. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I found this very interesting as we hit a break. Houston Heights Ag yesterday said he learned last night that a uh, fielder's choice is not a base hit. I'm like, buddy, you got to watch more baseball. <laughs> it's kind of like day one. Yeah, well. My wife would say that too, though, to be fair. That's not a hit? No, baby. It's not a hit. But he's on base. But he hit the ball. Why don't I make her sound like Mulkey? All right, uh, we're going to hit a break here. Thank you, OB. Appreciate you. When we come back here on Tex Ags Radio, Chris Phillips, SEC Unfiltered. We'll talk SEC football. We'll talk it all next on Tex Ags Radio.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. I feel bad. My Our next guest texted me last week as I was driving to Dallas because he had some A&M questions, and I never got back to him. And he still posted a video without my intel. What's up with Chris Phillips here from SEC Unfiltered? Chris, good morning, buddy. How are you? David, good morning. Appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, hey, listen, the opportunity is still there, man. We'd love to talk some Texas A&M football as we go into uh, spring games, obviously, coming up here in the next couple of weeks. But always a pleasure, man. I appreciate you having me on. Hey, uh, is that boxing gloves on your necklace? What is that? Give me. No, a little- it's a ring. So it's my grandfather's college ring. Yeah, awesome, so uh, he and I were really, really close growing up. He passed in 2014, so I, I, I wear the college ring there. So I love that, brother. That's, that's great. Hey, so let, let's talk about – so yesterday I had a – a different question than you had. I was talking about, you know, some unknowns for A&M football, but you have some questions for A&M football. And I thought maybe you could po- pose some of those questions to me and I can give you what I think about it. Um, you know, I think one of them was uh, about the culture. Am I right about that? Yeah, so just the implementation of the culture. I mean, I think that's something anytime you got a first-year head coach. And I mean, I think, I think the good news is, and where A&M's got that leg up, and I'm sure you would agree, is – it's not like Mike Elko doesn't understand what Texas a and is all about, right? He was there previously, so he gets, I think, the culture of the 12th man and what the expectations are. But I think any time, obviously, it's it's a complete overhaul. I would say it feels night and day different from what Jimbo Fisher and company were doing, sure. and that's no shot at Jimbo, but it just is a completely different vibe, which I think is going to be a net positive for a in the long run. But, you know, that was one of my questions, I think, or one of the questions I felt like Texas A&M needed to get answered this spring, which I'm sure they have, is just, um, you know, it's different verbiage, it's a different vibe. And, I, I, you know, I, I've been part of a team myself when, you know, you change over the head coaches or you change over the coaching staff, and and there's going to be guys in your roster that are kind of mixed feelings, mixed emotions, they're on the fence, and it's about winning everyone over in the locker room and making sure everyone is bought in because in the SEC where it's so competitive and the margins are razor thin – you need everybody bought in to have success. So I, I think that's important, obviously. And I'm sure he's doing that again, just laying the foundation uh, this spring. Chris, what I'll say to that is a couple things. First off, any SEC team that wins 12 games in two years is going to have a bad culture. There's no SEC team that has a great culture that loses, right? That's just a fact. So nobody was complaining about the culture at a and when they went to the Orange Bowl in 2020. And it's not like Jimbo Fisher forgot how to build a team. I think he lost a couple of his fastballs, no doubt about it, right? And uh, the transfer portal and you know the entitlement that a lot of athletes have today has changed a lot of what we see. But losing breeds discontent in a, in a, in a locker room. So that's, that's part of it. So I don't care if you're Nick Saban. If they won 12 games in two years, we'd be hearing very similar stuff about them. So that, that's A. B, the culture was really bad when they went five and seven, it was better at seven and five. There are things that were better. I do think that Mike Elko is addressing a lot of the deficiencies that AM had head on. And mm-hmm. like an example, the Connor Wigman told Billy Lucci on, on this show, you know, on this site a few months back that like they're having position groups sit with other position groups at lunch, right? So mm-hmm. you get to know everybody and have a different relationship. So until we see the wins and losses, we won't really know about the culture. And there are going to be some guys left over from the Jimbo era that probably just, it's too much for them. Tommy Moffat comes in and is asking for X, Y, and Z. Uh, but I do think you have to hold people accountable. And those who don't want to be held accountable, see ya. Yeah, David, it's, you know, culture is one of those buzzwords in today's college football that, you know, we talk about a lot. And it's one of those things where, like you mentioned, it's about wins and losses, right? So, um, you know, that I feel like it only mainly comes up when things aren't going well, but you do have to have it, right? It's an essential piece. Like you mentioned, you're not going to have a bad culture and win a whole lot of games. But, you know, in regards to on the field, man, I mean, the other things, which, you know, we, we'll talk about at some point, but we can talk about today is just, you know, I was curious about the wide receiver room yeah. and the linebacker room. And, and I feel like A&M obviously finding replacements there. I mean, certainly on the defensive side, when you lose Edron Cooper, that's a big loss. I know Torian York is back, but outside of that, it's kind of like who emerges in that wide receiver when you lose Anaya Smith and Evan Stewart. And I know, again, Texas A&M uh, was one of the best in the transfer portal, picking up uh, a number of impact guys, not just bodies, but impact guys. Troy transfer, La Tech transfer, some other dudes like Noah Thomas, Moose Muhammad that were big impact guys last year. That's who's going to take that next step. So, I mean, I, I, it's, that were some of, those were some of the questions that I had. Sure. But again, that's what spring ball is for is to find those answers. So I'll, I'll answer, I think a bigger question is cornerback. That's mm-hmm. a huge question for me. Uh, they did attack the portal. Secondary was rough in that in that in that bowl game. Yeah. That was well, I mean, and and they, again, they were down to like people who yeah, weren't playing, right? Out. 
But regardless, all season long, it was rough, right? All season long, cornerback was a problem. Tyreek Chappelle comes back. They've hit the portal hard. But I have a bigger question about that. I'd like to see what Will Lee does, right? There's other players that I want to see what they can do. Uh, Ricks, I want to see what he turns into. So I have a bigger question there than I do at linebacker. Although I do have the same question about linebacker because, yeah, you lose a guy like Edron Cooper. What does that mean for that group? Uh, Torrey and York was phenomenal. And they picked up Scooby Williams. They picked up some others at linebacker that I think could. They're not going to be Edge Cooper, but they can make the group better. And by the way, I feel much better about the defense under Mike Elko than I did under uh, DJ Durkin. And I like Durkin, but I don't think... I think there was too much of uh, shuffling going on there, especially with the defensive line with all the talent. One series would be these guys, the next series would be the other. I don't think it'll be that kind of world for Coach Elko. To the wide receiver group, 100% valid question, right? You don't lose a guy like Anaya Smith and get better. You just don't. As for Evan Stewart, you don't lose a talent like that and necessarily get better, but you look at what Jade Walker did last year, and he basically had the same numbers as Evan. And there are certain players and not, I think Evan was a very nice kid I enjoyed my interactions with him but when you play the social media game all the time about one foot in one foot out you know what fine bro I don't need you here like you don't want to be here that's fine go if you're looking for interactions this is not the place for you right now and this rebuilding that doesn't mean in college football you don't take those players because you take generational talent but sometimes if generational talent is in one foot in one foot out and they don't produce the way a generational talent should then you know what? Let's find out what we have. Uh, Cyrus Allen, Jamari uh, Barber. These are names that I hope become household names for A&M, but it is a valid question. Can Noah Thomas stay healthy all season long? Moose Muhammad, when he plays, he plays amazing. There were reasons he didn't play, and some of it was personality conflicts with the coach and obviously some issues with other guys at the depth chart. But Moose Muhammad can be a game-breaker and has been a game-breaker. Let's see it consistently. And David, to your point about Evan Stewart, it's one of those things too. Now, now we're in the NIL world, right? So if you're making an investment in a kid, you want his full buy-in. And when you don't have that, I mean, I don't blame anybody for saying, "Hey, no hard feelings, but we're better off going our separate ways." But you know, not related to spring, just the 2024 season. I think Texas A&M is actually one of the most fascinating teams in college football because year after year after year, for so long, right? The 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 hype that has surrounded the A&M program. It's far outweighed the production on the field. And this year, you look at it, I think Texas A&M is going to be set up really, really well, too. I don't know if sneak up on people is the right word, because I think the roster is still very talented. But, I mean, you look at the Vegas win total, over under eight and a half. For a first-year head coach, that is significant. I think A&M's draw in 2024 is one of the most favorable, right? It's still difficult. It's the SEC. But in regards to favorability, it's one of the most favorable. And I, I just... David, my hope is this. I, I, I think Texas A&M folks should keep their expectations high. I know you'll do that. There's a standard in College Station, which I think is great. But I hope people allow Texas A&M to overachieve. Like, I think that would be – that's a great feel-good thing in year one. There doesn't need to be immense amount of pressure or expectation or what have you. And I – you know, I think the good news for A&M is most of the storylines going in this season are going to revolve around Alabama because it's Alabama and you got Kalen DeBoer there. But um, I think Texas A&M could be a really feel-good story in year one. I think they could win nine games, maybe more. But uh, let's just allow Texas A&M to overachieve. That's all I'm saying. Well, let's take a look at the last three years. Mm. Bad teams find ways to lose games, right? Mm. And A&M found ways to lose games. But th- – Every one of these games, top team, very rarely did A&M get manhandled. I'll just look at last year's schedule alone, uh, some of the losses. The Miami loss was one of the more eye-popping games because that game was winnable, right? That game was absolutely winnable. But they lost on the road. They found a way to lose, and they've lost on the road for years, right? Um, the, the other loss, the Alabama game. They were a possession away from winning that game. They were dominating at the half. Or not dominating, but they were significantly doing what they had to do, right? Tennessee. They lost by seven on the road. They couldn't do anything offensively at all in that game. Uh, they beat South Carolina. Ole Miss, they had a chance to win on the last you know, minute of the game. These are games that came down to the last play. And some of it was scheme. Some of it was just dumb mistakes. You clean up a little bit of that these last couple years, Jimbo Fisher is still the head coach. By the way, a bulk of that talent is still here. Maybe not all that talent, but a ball. And now you're playing the uh, transfer portal game. They brought in guys. What, 30 dudes? Like, you bring in guys that will compete for starting jobs. So, I look, 
I have no, no none of us like SEC Mike likes to throw hot sports takes. I don't have a hot sports take because I don't know. I've got to see what I got to see things. If they fix the offensive line, this team is a nine ten win team. If they don't, we're right back to eight and four, seven and five. But I think they're trending on, uh, in that direction to fix that offensive line. Yeah, and I hope to see it too. And again, Texas A and M fans, I think, have been very patient. Obviously, there haven't been a double digit win season since what twenty twelve, I believe, with Johnny Manziel. So I think it's coming with Mike Elko. I mean, I, I you know what he did at Duke, I think, speaks alone. When you can go at a place like a Duke, where you talk about having no expectations or really no standards, and a school that cares much, much more about round ball, I think, than football. Um, you know, what he did there was wildly impressive. So I, I think the culture change, the culture shift is going to pay off major dividends. And again, like you mentioned, man, I mean, even watching the bowl game, and I know not all of those guys are back, but I, my one of my biggest takeaways was it's not like they're starting from scratch. Even with the guys you lost in the portal, like there's a lot of talent on the defensive line still. Uh, there's still going to be offensive playmakers. Obviously, Connor Wegman is back. He's going to be one of the most, I think, under-hyped quarterbacks in the SEC. So as long as he stays healthy, man, I, mean, I think Texas A&M, like you mentioned, I think 9-10 wins is certainly possible. Is Connor Wigman a top-five quarterback in the SEC if he stays healthy? If he stays healthy, yeah. I, I do believe so. Um, you know, he was a guy that I looked at highly favorably last year. Um, obviously, the injuries derailed his season. But, yes, if he is healthy, I think certainly you can make a major case for him being a top five quarterback. And I think he's got the talent, the upside to be a top three quarterback, but things have got to pan out, right? That takes some guys around him playing to their full potential, but no question in my mind, he can be a top five quarterback. what did you think a month ago with the Trev Alberts hire there for Texas A&M? I thought it was a really good hire. I, I thought it was the right answer for Texas A&M. I feel like A&M, um, you know, there were a couple different directions they could have gone, but I thought the Trev Alberts hire was solid and, um, you know, I was impressed with it overall. I mean, I, I think it was what Texas A&M needed. So I, I thought overall it was a positive hire. And I know we actually did a segment on that. And uh, basically everyone, I think, in our staff thought that that was a positive hire as well. So I, I think it was a really good hire for A&M. All right. Your crystal ball today. Who are the top two teams in the SEC? Is it is it easy? Is it Georgia, Texas in your eyes? Or does it go a little bit deeper? Is Ole Miss the team? You know, it's funny. I was about to ask you, are we talking football or baseball? Because I think A&M on the diamond has got a say in that, too. Heck yeah, they do. Um, and I got a big series this weekend, actually, in Columbia against South Carolina. But, uh, I mean, I think it's really easy to say right now. And so you're asking me, Crystal Ball, when we're talking end of season or going into the season, who are the top two? Teams? Going into the season. Going and, into and, the season. And then follow it up after the season. Or Yeah, I mean, I think going in, it's it's hard not to say Georgia and Texas just because, I mean, Georgia is in there, no question. They're they're in that conversation. They're in the top two before and after the season, in my opinion. Texas is going to get the majority of the hype. And again, you guys know exactly what that's like, how much hype Texas gets on a year-in, year-out basis. It's been a lot of fun, by the way, not just interacting with you guys, but the Oklahoma folks as well and how much they're like, hey, put a damper on that. We've heard that many years, and they never come through up until last year, right? So I think Texas going in, um, I'll say Georgia and Ole Miss – end of season are the top two teams. I, I just, I mean, dude, if, if, if Ole Miss wins less than 10 games, it is a massively disappointing season for them. Like when you look at the talent they brought in, it might be the most talented defense they've ever had in school history. You know, you got Lane Kiffin. We just dropped a segment this morning about Lane Kiffin talking about uh, how it's a cheat code that they've got, you know, they've got the communication with the quarterbacks and the helmets and stuff like that now for the first 25 seconds, the play clock. I mean, the embarrassment of riches they've got on the offensive side. The schedule sets up beautifully for them. If they don't win 11 games, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to look at that as a disappointment. So uh, I'll go Georgia Ole Miss at the end of the season as the top two standing. My uh, retort to Texas, look, I know they're good. Obviously, they made the college football playoffs, but I look at what they did last year in the Big 12. How many of those games should they have lost or could they have lost? Now, I, I use that same logic for A&M games that they should have won, but you look at the uh, the Houston game, you know how that game ended, right? That Houston could have easily won that game, and, and, and some people think they were robbed. The K-State game went into overtime. That's another loss. Uh, Iowa State had their chances at the end. TCU had their chances at the end. Uh, this ain't the Big 12, brother, right? Like, they ha of the SEC schedule you could pick, I think it's a very nice one for Texas, no doubt about it. Because um, you get Georgia at home, you get Michigan rebuilding, right? So there, there are there are definitely things that are pointing it in it being an easier season. But if you look at Sark's totality as a head coach and really at his time at Texas, this year could prove a lot in his legacy because you should have won a national championship or been to more playoffs in the Big Twelve because now it's going to get hard. Mm -hmm. 
My question to you, David, is this. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to your question with a question. How much goodwill would Mike Elko build? I know it's just not all about beating your rival, but if you end the season beating Texas, I feel like that's a pretty good way to start your tenure off in College Station. Sure. I mean, we, that, that week, it'll be the most important thing in the world for all of us, right? I'm concerned about making the playoffs. I'm concerned about blocking and keeping our quarterback healthy for the first time in three years. Um, <laughs> and if that means if, – if A&M is playing at a playoff level – come that game against Texas. Oh, yeah. It's, it, I mean, the atmosphere is going to be crazy anyway. But if, if A&M and Texas are both battling it out for one of those spots, yeah. Um, and that me, to me, that means everything is clicking for A&M, which would mean A&M is winning that game in that scenario. But w- there's a long way to go before that. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see that rivalry play out, man. I mean, I, I've heard about it for quite a long time. It's, I guess, what was the last time they played on the football field? Was it 2000, early 2010s, right? Was 2011 it- season. 2011 season yes yeah. I mean it's it's been quite a while and I remember watching those games and just the the nastiness and the, the energy and the emotion obviously we've seen it on the diamond play out and that's always a lot of fun but uh yeah to see that rivalry renewed man it's 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 been gone far too long and I mean like you mentioned man with Texas I mean who knows man first year in the SEC I know they don't like to hear it right both Texas and Oklahoma and I know the expectations are much more conservative for OU but I mean you know, I reminded people a couple weeks ago, weeks ago that Oklahoma beat Texas last year. So, like, who knows? You know what I mean? And in the SEC, the difference is from the Big 12 to the SEC, if you lose to Oklahoma one week, like next week you got LSU, you got A&M, you got Florida, you got Georgia, you got Ole Miss. Like, there are literally no weeks off. And I think the thing that separates it, too, is when you play these middle-of-the-pack teams or even lower-level teams, there truly are no Saturdays off. So, it's going to be very interesting to see how both Texas and OU handle life in the SEC in year one. Who's got the biggest boom or bust potential this year in the SEC? That's a good question, David. I, I lean the Auburn Tigers. I, okay. I do. I, I think Auburn is primed to take a major step forward. Um, you know, you could label Texas taking him, I guess, but I, I don't think it would be fair to label anything in Mike Elko's first year as a bust just because there's so many new moving pieces right in a year one. Again, the culture shift and, and terminology and verbiage and brand new coaching staff, et cetera. So I'll go Auburn in year two with you freeze. I mean, I think you look at them last year, right? They were another team that was really, really close. Could have beaten Georgia, probably should have beaten Alabama. They also experienced the the lowest of the lows, that New Mexico State game and that ugly bowl game against Maryland. So, um, you know, I'm not a huge believer in Peyton Thorne at the quarterback position immediately, but – Hugh Freeze takes over play calling. If he can get the best out of him, I, I think Auburn could be a sneaky team to win eight or nine games. Am I alone in thinking, ah, I just am not buying LSU as much as a lot of other people are? And look, h- here are the reasons why I could buy them. Because the years that I haven't bought them, they seem to do amazing things, right? Uh, but no Jaden Daniels. I, I, the defense, maybe it's better. It can't, it can't be worse. Uh, but you lose three first-round picks on the offense, potentially. Like, how can you, and they were what, 9-3 and three last year before the bowl game, right? So how can you be better without three NFL pros? Maybe they are. Maybe, you know, they fix the defense and it changes everything. But I'm having a hard time seeing them being better. It's kind of like you said, David, when talking about like a, a guy like Anaya Smith. Like you don't lose a guy like that and your wide receiver room necessarily gets better, at least in the short term. You don't lose your Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and get better offensively. Like, as good as Garrett Nussmeyer, I think, could be, he was great in that bowl game against Wisconsin, obviously leading them late and winning that ball game. Garrett Nussmeyer has been very, very inconsistent throughout his tenure. Like you mentioned, it's not just him. You lose Malik Neighbors, too. So they've got talent on the offensive side, but I think they're going to have to win games differently. Like, I think they're still going to be able to score. Don't get me wrong. They got a veteran offensive line, which is a great place to start. They got a lot of young talent in the running back room, but that defense, I mean, that defense was historically bad and they got to take a couple steps forward this year. I thought the hiring of Blake Baker at DC was a fantastic hire. I think they're going to utilize Harold Perkins in a much better way. I think he's going to get back to that 2022 form that saw him be arguably the best defensive player in the SEC that year. But I mean, to your point, man, you lose all that talent. How are you going to take a step forward and get better? I I still think LSU is going to be one of those teams right on the edge of nine or ten wins fighting for a college football playoff spot. But to your point, David, I mean, again, you lose as much as they did. They're going to have to win games different ways. And if that defense doesn't take the steps forward they're hoping, it it could be a year of regression for Brian Kelly. I don't have Oklahoma schedule in front of me, but I I just want to – finish with them I looked at Texas's schedule and you see the Georgia and the Michigan games you're like oh I eyebrow but then you also see Vandy and some of the other games that they have like all right not too bad of an SEC schedule considering Oklahoma when I looked at it a couple weeks back that 
I, I'm worried about them in, in a good way. Like, I don't mind. Like, but what do you <laughs> see with Oklahoma this year? Yeah, they got a brutal schedule. I mean, like you mentioned, it starts early. They got Houston um, in non-conference play. Tulane is a sneaky game you can't sleep on. And obviously open up SEC play against Tennessee. Um, you know, when it comes to Oklahoma, I'm a little nervous for them, admittedly. Um, they have question marks, David, and you know this, right? They have question marks where you cannot afford to have question marks in the SEC. That's it, quarterback and the offensive line. And I, I think Jackson Arnold, you know, you watch the bowl game. A lot of the mistakes he made were correctable, and I think you saw the upside as well and the potential. And I think he could be, you know, one of those guys. He, he's got the potential to be a top half of the SEC quarterback, but he has no experience in the conference. And, again, the offensive line is what I really worry about. You lost so much there. It's it's kind of a patchwork group at this point at least. Um, and I think this is a big year for Brent Venable's defense, right? Like when you hire a guy and it's like that's they have a calling card one way or another, Um you need to at least see that side of the ball pan out. I thought it was much, much better last year, but year one was rough. The defense needs to take another step. And again, the, the schedule is brutal. I mean, you got to go to Auburn, you got to go to Ole Miss, you got to go to Mizzou, you got to go to LSU, you got Bama mixed in there as well. Um, so it's a brutal schedule. So I mean, I, I think this could be a seven and five team. I know Oklahoma fans don't want to hear that. The over under win total in Vegas is six and a half. And I think it's that number for a reason because the schedule really start to finish, right? When you break down this schedule, wins, toss-ups, and losses, uh, there's a lot of toss-ups on this schedule. There's not a, game, a lot of games you look at and check off and say that's an automatic win. So uh, when it comes to Texas and Oklahoma coming in the league, you're one who I'm more worried about. Certainly it's Oklahoma. But, I mean, if the offensive line pans out, I definitely think Jackson Arnold's a guy that has the potential on the upside to make that thing go. And if that defense takes a step forward, they could certainly uh, make some noise in the SEC year one. But – I could see it being a year of growing pain, no doubt, for them. Chris, great stuff, man. Thanks so much. David, appreciate you, man. Always a pleasure. Appreciate you. Yeah, Chris Phillips there, SEC Unfiltered. Check out his YouTube channel. Does great work out there. All right, we'll hit a break. We'll come back with Around the SEC right now. Caldwell Country Chevrolet Time Highway 21 in Caldwell and online at caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. Go check out the website. Uh, you know, that's what people do when they're searching for things, right? You go to the website first. You see what the prices are. You see the selection out there, the inventory, and then, and then you you – Take a trip out there to Caldwell Country Chevrolet. You're going to be uh, greeted with the best customer service, and that is something that's going to happen during the process and after the process. They are great. They will help you find the right vehicle that fits your needs at your time, at your budget. They've got great pricing. They've got great trade-in value and the best customer service, as I mentioned. Complimentary pickup and delivery for all of their service customers. It is the place to go in the Brazos Valley to get your vehicle on. That's right. Go find your vehicle there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. About a 15-minute drive, the very edge of Bryan to the beginnings of Caldwell. Short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell online. CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com.
All right, welcome back into the program. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. We're going to do around the SEC before we talk to Coach uh, Cortan. But, look, Luke Evangelist got a little mouthy earlier in the show. And uh, we had to make a change. So let's go to the Angry Elephant. I feel bad even announcing it to the people. We go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Callie Gardner's there now. Callie, good morning. Good morning, David. How's it going? It's, it's going. How, how you been? I've been good. Had a good Easter, ready to be back in action and doing all the things. Yeah, thank you for coming in in, a, in the clutch there <laughs> after the issue with Luke. And, you know, you rushed here when we threw him out of the office. So thank you very much for that. Anytime. Happy to be here. Sorry, Luke. Uh, let's do the uh, around the SEC thing, shall we? We shall. Um, oh, so, no, not around the SEC. I'm sorry. No, we're, we're going to do that later. We're going to do uh, the uh, UFL. We have yeah, a bunch of Aggies playing in the UFL, right? We do. We've got quite a few. Um, Anthony Hines and Jameer Ross Johnson are currently playing for the D.C. Defenders. Uh, Trey Williams and Dalen Mack are playing for the Mem- Memphis Showboats. Avery Genesee plays for the Houston Roughnecks. And Tyree Johnson plays for the Michigan Panthers. They all had games this past week. Uh, no... Uh, real stats to show for them, but Jay Sternberger is a tight end for the Birmingham Stallions, and he had two receptions for 32 yards in their 27 to 14 win over the Arlington Renegades. Uh, and he broke the modern USFL record for the most touchdown catches in the season with eight um, prior to joining the UFL. Um, and this next week, Dalen Mack and the Showboats will host the Brahmas on Saturday at 11 a.m. on ESPN. Jay Sternberger and Ty- Tyree Johnson will face off on Sunday at 11 a.m. on ESPN and the Roughnecks. And Avery Genesee will travel to D.C. to play the Defenders at 3 o'clock on Sunday on Fox. Yeah, I I want to like the XFL, the UFL. I want to like that stuff. I just don't. I don't hate it. I just don't necessarily like it. Nick, do you pay attention at all? Yeah, I had a few of the games on this weekend. Wow. But like, I mean... As soon as Aggie baseball would come on or like the Astros, it would be, you know, switch the channel. But like, I, I kind of agree with what Luke was saying earlier. I think, you know, the interest isn't quite there yet because of March Madness still going on. Yeah. And maybe, you know, opening weekend for MLB this weekend uh, draws away from it. But I mean, I feel like the XFL, at least last year, caught people's attention. But uh, I'd say give it a few weeks and we'll see if it, you know, people are still like, meh, then it's not looking good. But I feel like people will come around because it's football. Who doesn't love football? I think it all kind of depends on where you are sports fan-wise, right? Like if your baseball team is number three in the country, if you're into March Madness, you're not interested right now. But once your team sucks, right? If you're, uh, I don't know, are the Spurs bad this year? If the Spurs are bad this year, whatever, they don't have a chance for the playoffs and you're in San Antonio. you're an Oakland A's fan. If you're in Oak- By the way, I'm so confused about that Oakland A's thing. I thought they were moving to Vegas, and now they're like... Pretend- they are in like 2027 or something But like they're going to renew with the Oakland Coliseum yeah, for the next three years. it's very strange and play in front of like 100 people every day, at least in their home ballpark. Yeah, um, just that whole situation is Did strange. you see that they sent down... I, I, his name escapes me, but they sent down... Like their best performer from the first series, he was hitting like 400 in, in three games or something like that. And they sent him down. And he was getting at bats. It's not like it was like two at bats. Like he, he was getting at bats. He's batting like 400 and they send him down. So it's like they're not even trying. They're not trying. It's just the, the whole situation is weird. And look, I think of, I grew up an A's fan um, because of Conseco. Apologies for admitting that out loud. It, it's going to be weird for them to be somewhere else. Just like it's weird for the Raiders to be in Las Vegas. I'm sorry. I think that's just weird. I mean, I'm, it's been a couple of years now. I'm used to it, but I still think it's weird. All right, let's hit a break. When we come back, Brian Corton in studio. We'll talk a little Aggie men's golf as they're getting ready for the Aggie Invitational. Right now, caller number one, we're going to give you a free car wash from Aggie Land Express Car Wash in South College Station. They're off of William D. Fitch and Greens Prairie. Aggie owned and operated with the friendliest staff and a personal touch. They offer a monthly membership. We'll give the first caller a free car wash right now from Aggie Land Express in South College Station. 979-693-1150.
All right, we're back here on Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, fresh off their uh, finish at the Valspar Invitational. And a men's golf team is getting ready for the uh, Aggie Invitational at Traditions this upcoming weekend. Let's talk to Brian Corton here in studio. Coach Corton, hello, sir. Hello, good to see you. We're fixing college athletics during the break, so we've got I a lot of ideas. I, I'm pretty sure we can figure it out. You and I, we got it. I feel like some of these things that are out there that takes years to fix, I think over coffee you could figure out something better than is happening in, in college sports. Man, there's so many things being tugged so many different directions. But, yeah. you know, the, the bottom line, in my opinion, is that it's still college athletics, and it's great. I mean, to see, you know, young men and women compete and, and represent their school and themselves and their families and, and do it at a, just an incredibly high level. I mean, it's, it's still at the core, very genuine yeah. and, and very, you know, very fan-friendly, and, and it's just a fun to – it's joy to watch. Um, but you know, life's changing. It's changing for you and I. It's changing for college athletes. So – We'll Got to evolve. Got to keep moving, keep evolving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, any big takeaways from the uh, Valspar? You know, we've we've had a really a, a pretty decent spring in terms of how we've played some golf. Um, we've gotten better. I mean, we've gotten better from January to this point. Um, we've fought a few things here and there with some some been dinged up a little bit. You don't think about it in golf, but we've had a few guys battle, battle a few things. But uh, no, we go to Valspar, and it's I mean, it's a it's as good a field as you can get in college golf, and we actually beat the number one team in the country in North Carolina and, you know, another couple other single digit rated teams. And, and I know we finished seventh, but we were probably about three or four swings, three or four good shots away from finishing, you know, third or fourth in a, in a, just an absolutely dead loaded field. So um, a lot of positives came from that week. Beating teams that are single digits and top teams in the country. Does it have an effect later on just mentally? Like, look, look what we did against this team and what we did against this team. Or is it really more what's happening that weekend? Um, I, I think it, it helps your message live a little bit mm -hmm. stronger within your guys. I mean, it's we talk to our guys and tell them that uh, you guys were, were able. Um, our good golf is as good as anybody's. And, and, and when you can have a week where you play some, some good golf and beat some really high-quality teams, um, it helps that message resonate a little better. And then when you're taking on these top programs, how does it get you ready for SECs? Well, our SEC, you know, conference is, is loaded. It's loaded in golf. It's loaded in baseball. It's loaded in softball. It's, man, it's just loaded. I mean, pick your sport. But um, it's just great competition. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the conference is so strong, and, and it's it's got such a strong base to it with fan bases and, and universities that really – um, enhance the athletes, uh, enhance their experience, enhance the competition. So um, it gets us ready because we know that, you know, we've hit some shots that matter and uh, we've played against some teams that are really good and, and we know each other a little bit. And, uh, you know, the intimidation and, uh, you know, knowing who's who just kind of wears off and it just becomes golf at that point, which is nice. How uh, impressed were you, were you with the final round overall, though, the way you all battled? You know, our guys battle. They're a, they're, they're a fighting group, and that's kind of – I guess that's kind of our calling card is we're kind of a blue-collar group. Um, they work hard. They, I mean, they work their tails off in the gym, They and they do it willingly. Um, and, they, I mean, they love it. They go to the golf course. I, I rarely have to get into them about effort and time, um, and sometimes it's it spills over a little too much. Like we've had a extra – we call it extra cardio session the other day because we got a little too emotional on the golf course, mm -hmm. um, which I don't hate because I, th I think they generally love what they do and, and they love to be the good at it. So when it's not at the level that they want, they get a little frustrated, which is warranted. They, they put the time in. So um, they expect to do well, which, which is what I want. Excuse the ignorance. When did cardio and weightlifting become a, a golf thing? I know it's been a thing, but like, like when did it kind of change? Like this is, is it the Tiger era, the beginning? Well, of I mean, yeah, you can point to a lot of things. When I was in college, I mean, a hundred years ago, I played one of the best players in college was on my team. His name was Tim Heron. Okay. And notoriously known as Lumpy. Just a wonderful personality. But uh, we didn't work out a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we did not work out much. But it, it slowly evolved probably in the, the late 80s into the early 90s into, into some cardio stuff and then into some stretching and lifting. And, and now it's full on, like – I asked Bo Sandoval, I said, when he started with us, I said, please just treat my guys like athletes when they're in here. Mm -hmm. They get treated like golfers every place else. Please treat them like athletes. And, and they're treated like athletes. They're expected to move like athletes, work like athletes, and, and they do a great job. I mean, it's, it's golf-centered movements, but it's, they're not, it's not soft yeah. in any way, shape, or form, which is I love it and they love it. 
Talk a little bit about Bo. I, I, I follow him on Instagram. He's great. He, he can fight. He can lift. He does it all. Uh, yeah, he's in in that world. He's he is his knowledge is incredible. I love yeah. talking to him about all that stuff, and um, his stories are pretty good. And and it's just he's straight up honest. Um, he's, he's just a good dude. We're fortunate that he's you know, not only at A and M, but we get to work with him you know every day or I don't know, for our workouts. And just he's just a great guy and. And really pushes our guys. I mean, he understood yeah. it from the day one. I was like, he couldn't. I mean, I don't think he really could believe that he went from MMA to working with golfers. But in our first conversation, I says, "Don't treat them like golfers. That's they don't need that." And and he's been awesome with that. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit. I, I think people should know, but some don't know Vishnu's story. Can you kind of share a little bit about his personality and uh, his <laughs> travel? Yeah. Now, Vish is awesome. Um, you know, he couldn't hit a golf ball. I mean, he's probably gonna chew me out later for saying this but he you know kind of says it proudly because this is how far he's come when he was a junior in high school i think was the first time he could hit a golf ball over 200 yards in the air Hmm. um we recruited him um he had a passion and a smile and great hands and i mean just all some 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 intangibles that that you kind of looked at but um we knew he was going to be a project and and he took the challenge on and um he came you know he's you know he's from uh Perlin, texas um, you know, he's a bit near and he's not like the most robust fella. But now if you saw him compared to how he stepped on campus, he is an adult. He's got strength. He can hit a golf ball 275 yards in the air. Like, um, he's evolved into really just a, a more physical, you know, person and, and being able to compete at a really high level in college golf. So um, to watch him evolve over four years and and just take all those – steps head on Mm -hmm. and with a smile and and he's just been an incredible sponge um it's it's been a joy to watch honestly and and he'll not meet a nicer guy yeah he's incredibly competitive but just to have a conversation with him just he's he's great i mean he's we're we're fortunate to have him in our program talk to us a little bit about daniel rodriguez this season you know roddy's this is a senior year so he's our only senior so he's he's really i'd want to say he's you know, played better this year than he ever has, and he, and he's and he's continued to evolve as a player mm-hmm. and get better and and evolve in how he works at it. Um, he's a really talented guy. Um, he's from Portugal, and just to meet him, you wouldn't know it, but dude is competitive. Yeah, he might be the most competitive guy on the team. Um, not that I really compare him in terms of how they're com- how they compete, but he is he's got a huge competitive heart, um, and he's not a huge guy, so. And maybe that's part of it, but he's he's really, you know, he's one of the you know one of he's in the top level of college golfers. Um, nobody wants would want to play that guy in a match. Um, he's been incredible in match play for us, and he's put together a bunch of really good tournaments here, a bunch of top tens. Um, and even when he hasn't played well, he had a, he had a bad second round in Valspar. He bounced back with a really good final round. Um, just you know, he's he's got a chance to be a, a very successful professional um, if that's what he chooses to do. And, and which I hope he does because he's a really talented golfer. But, again, and also just a really good, thoughtful person. Um, and I'm thankful that he, you know, four years ago, he's the first guy that I could – that class, Vishnu, Michael Heidebaugh, and, and uh, Danny Rodriguez my, were my first freshmen when I was the interim head coach. So um, thankful those guys joined the, joined the ride back then, and we've had a really uh, great relationship. How much has this team grown? Because when Sammy was here, he got a lot of the attention, and he bailed you out a lot. And, but – these guys had to step up this year, and they've, they've done a really good job doing that. They've done a nice job. I mean, it's, you know, Sammy leaves, and, you know, he, you think he leaves a hole, and he does leave a hole. But, you know, the guys you miss, everybody knows a star, you know, the guy that leaves, and that's what, you know, obviously with Sammy or, you know, the year prior, maybe Walker. Mm-hmm. You know, you can kind of add those guys up. But when you lose a guy like Willie Pacey, too, that's a really tough one to tough swallow because he he was a lineup guy, and he was reliable and, and a really good player. Um, a really good college player for four years. So those guys are really hard to replace as well. So to lose Sammy, who was kind of your headliner, and then Willie, who just kind of played, just kind of played like Willie plays, and yeah. which was really good. Um, you kind of add those two up. It was it was a tough adjustment for guys to step up in that kind of moving up into the starter role or you know moving up a slot or two in, in the lineup. Um, you see it in all kinds of different all, all other sports as well, and golf's kind of the same way when you break it down to a team sport. So help us understand the schedule. You've got the Aggie Invitational coming up, and then obviously it's postseason time. Yeah, we have a, the Aggie this weekend, um, Saturday, Sunday, free golf. Y'all come out and watch us at the Traditions. Um, it, it'll, be a, it'll be a good time, good teams. And there's 
really a lot of people to come out and watch. So it's a really nice atmosphere. So really looking forward to this weekend. I mean, that's why we have it. Yeah. So our guys can play in front of the home fans and their families and stuff. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then from there, we've got about not quite two weeks until we head to um, conference, which Sea Island and and against, you know, in the best conference in the country. So um, we'll have a time to catch a breath after the Aggie, um, get ready, and, and then head to Sea Island. And then after that, we do regionals and then on and further into postseason. So this is kind of the time that you're working hard to peak. And, and, we're, and I think we're getting close. We're getting close to being our, our best version of who we are. You like the direction you're going? Really do. I mean, we've yeah. done a really good job. I mean, not, the guys have done a great job of <clears throat> taking some coaching. Uh, Coach Fast does a really nice job with the conversation piece and, and the competitive piece and talking to them about, you know, just things that we need to work on. And, and, and then, you know, we get together and collaborate and, you know, and push, push some buttons. Um, and the guys have been great. They've been, you know, eyes wide open and, and, and getting after it. So that's great. I don't know if you have the info on you, but I saw on Twitter the Aggie Golf Association annual golf day is three weeks away, so that's a, a good event. It's a huge event for us. It's the 19th. Um, we've got we've been blessed with with you know a bunch of Aggies that just love golf, and and we're fortunate they, that they chose to support us and come out and support us. So we'll have 100 to 150 guys playing, um, prizes, dinners. It's 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 a good time, and they uh, get the the Sarge logo A and M golf gear too. So yeah. it's kind of a a nice thing to have, a nice perk. Well, that's awesome. Good luck, and we'll get you on hopefully right before or after the uh, the SEC. Uh, SEC yeah, let's, let's me. do it. We'll talk about an Aggie win. Let's do it after this weekend. Let's do that, my friend. Thank you Sounds very good, much. Right? Appreciate you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, Brian Corton here in the studio. We'll come back here in about two minutes. It's Tex Ags Radio.
You know that's Drake, right? I do know that's Drake. How'd you know? I don't know how I knew. You guys talk Spanish at home, so. I yeah, get that's it, yeah. true. It is Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Get you ready uh, quickly for the uh, A&M baseball game tonight against Texas State. Looking forward to that one. A couple things I want to say about it. There's many who don't think these, you know, midweek games matter. Championship teams, to me, absolutely, it matters. <laughs> like, like, you win these games. Uh, I know Florida's having a very nice season. Uh, well, some would say not having a nice season because they've dropped a bunch of the, the midweek games. But the SEC games are the ones that matter. I like championship mentality throughout. I don't care who you play. And Texas State's a really good program. Uh, there's a reason. There's some of the stats right there. They can score, obviously. Um, they can hit the ball. They, uh, their pitching has been a little suspect this year, but they can score some runs, no doubt about it. So I was looking at the game notes that uh, A&M Kyle Stafford sent out. I'm just going to read you a couple of the things about this offense just to kind of get you ready for, for tonight. Offensively, the Maroon and White sit second in the nation in walks, 204 walks on the year. Ninth in home runs with 56, and I think that number will continue to rise, obviously. Ninth in on-base percentage at 438. Tenth in home runs per game at two per game. Fourteenth in slugging percentage at 557. Eighteenth in runs. And in the field, A&M is seventh in the country in fielding percent- percentage, excuse me, with a 984 mark. So you think that's good. Now let's go to the core of the team, the the three numbers that really need to matter, the uh, one, two, three lineup, right? Uh, Gavin Krahovic and Jace Lavalette and Braden Montgomery have combined for 113 of AM's 236 RBIs this year. So that trio right there, almost half of the runs have come from them. And the offense is loaded beyond that. But those three have been that special when it comes to driving in runs and obviously home runs because uh, Jace has 13. Uh, I believe Braden has 16. And Grohovic's got nine. Oh, and by the way, Last year, I believe Braden Montgomery hit 17 home runs. What did I say, Callie, he has this year? He's Sorry. got 16. Sorry, I, yeah, 16 home runs. Well, and he leads the nation, and he's just a really impressive player overall. And I was talking to one of my friends about Braden Montgomery, um, and I was, I was curious if he, he thought that Braden was going to claim A&M or Stanford when he um, – goes to play in the major leagues if he stays healthy because we all know that's where he's headed. Um, and I think he's going to claim A&M, and my friend thinks he's going to claim A&M. But, I mean, he's got a lot of ties to Stanford, and they had a lot of um, a lot to do with his current success. So. Sure. If he was a College World Series, I'll agree with you. If not, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to go with history, right? I mean, he spent, was it three years there? So Yeah, he's he's an impressive player, and they, they, they do have a lot to – um, he has a lot to thank for for Stanford helping him out, but I think I think A and M is where he's gonna take off. So hey, by the way, who was the SEC Player of the Week? That would be Braden Montgomery. Braden Montgomery on the year, forty seven RBI, sits second in home runs with sixteen, ranks third nationally in total bases, and third in RBIs per game at one point six eight, fourth in home runs per game at point five seven, and fifth in slugging percentage. Oh, and uh, if you forgot, there's another great player that we just talked about a moment ago. His name is Jason Lavalette. Ranks third in the SEC in runs scored, fourth in homers at 13, fifth in homers per game at .46, tenth in RBI, tenth in slugging percentage. Obviously, we, we talked about Gavin Krahovic as well. So these guys are getting it done. The big question all season long was, is, is going to continue to be, and was, we knew the offense was going to be able to mash. How would their pitching do? Ryan Prager's had a couple of interesting outings, but other than that, he's been stellar, right? He's been really good. Um, and... Justin Lampkin obviously has some really nice moments as well. So you, you look at starting pitching. You look at uh, what they've been able to get from Evan Oshenbeck. Then it becomes middle relief beyond that, right? And they've had a couple of some games that you wish they could get back. But overall, I mean, you can't get to that record at 25-3 and three and know how to have really good pitching to match with the offense. Hey, David, can I uh, chime in real quick? Um, hold on. Kind Three, of backing up two, to what you started with. One, go ahead. The reason this game matters and, you know, a kind of big picture, I know we haven't really talked about it too much because it's been mostly, we've been mostly focused on the basketball team, but big picture, like regional host, stuff like that for Aggie baseball, these games matter tonight because of RPI, kind of uh, the net, like similar to the net rankings right. in basketball, RPI, A&M is eighth in the country in RBI right now, Te- uh, RPI, not RBI, 
uh, Texas State 80th in the country. So it's kind of one of those games that's like, it's not really going to help A&M too much if they win. It's a good road win, quality road win, but like it will do a lot more damage if you drop it. So I guess in the big picture, when we're talking about, you know, hosting a regional, if, if, you know, Aggie baseball can continue their success in SEC play, which I think we all can uh, think they can, you know, that wins like this is what's, you know, going to really say, Hey, these guys deserve a regional host spot and maybe even a super regional host spot if they get there. Yeah. Take care of business tonight. And then obviously you go on the road to South Carolina, who's a really good program. Was it Billy who said it yesterday or maybe Bronny? He wouldn't be surprised to see them in the college world yeah. series. Right? Guess who's ninth in the RPI. That would be South Carolina. That would be South Carolina. You know how I knew that? Because I asked you. Yeah, and I had just mentioned South Carolina, so I said, all right, he's probably talking about South Carolina. But I wasn't for sure. I just threw it out there. That's why you are in the host chair, my good friend and mentor, David Duno. Uh, mentor? How often do you come to me for mentoring advice? Mm -hmm. Quite a bit. We got to hit a break. Yeah. Uh, We got 20 seconds. Why not just talk a little bit more? Let's find out your feelings, Nick. Never mind. It is Tex-Ags Radio. We'll have Tom Hart next on the other side. We'll see you in a bit.
I wish I was as cool as Tom Hart. I mean, this dude lives a charm life. Goes to any SEC game he wants. Like, people know him at airports. And right now, he's just chilling on the beach. Tom, good morning, buddy. Good morning. How are you? This is... Where are you? This is beautiful. Uh, this is Paradise Island in the Bahamas. Oh, gosh, so nice. The water, as you can see, is crystal clear. It's a beautiful blue green. I don't know how God found this palette, but it is perfect. The weather is gorgeous. And um, yeah, I felt like I needed a break. So here I am. Good for you, buddy. Hey, so it's interesting. People, we do live a great life, right? Covering sports and doing what yeah. we do. But like there's pockets of vacation that are available that are very, people don't understand like, well, what, what about the summer? Well, there's training camp and there's SEC media days and there's this and that. What about spring break? Well, there's the NCAA tournament. There's conference championships and conference tournaments. There's not a lot of pockets. What about Christmas and New Year's? Well, there's a bowl game probably. Not often, yeah. here, but recently. Overall, just uh, what, is this your window? Is this it like kind of right now? Pretty tight window. Um, we've got spring break with the kids, and the family went in multiple directions. And my 12-year-old, who's down the beach right now, said, Daddy, can we just go somewhere where there's sun and sand and you? And that's all she wanted was time with Dad. I said, yeah, let's go. So I left Fayetteville at uh, 6 a.m. Saturday morning after working the game Friday night. I literally had three suitcases packed last week. I don't know how inappropriate the shot is, by the way. If I, I know my tarp's off. If I get too low, let me know. Uh, I had three bags packed last week because I did the NIT on Tuesday, flew home Wednesday, grabbed my bag, left Wednesday night, went to baseball for two nights, came home, grabbed the third bag. So I landed Saturday, left Saturday afternoon, ended up here, and then uh, I'll be in uh, Baton Rouge Thursday for more baseball. So, yeah, but you got to find – no matter what your job is, you if you've got a window, you've got to find that window and take advantage of it. You, you, you certainly do. Did you find time, because I don't know if I would have there on the beach, to watch the uh, LSU-Iowa game last night? It was, it was amazing in that it was on everywhere we went. Um, finished dinner, went for a walk, got some ice cream. It was on in the lobby where the ice cream was. Uh, walked through the casino. It was on everywhere in the casino. Came through the casino to another sandwich shop. It was on. The, and it wasn't just on. People were invested in it. I mean, there was cheering. It was like the Super Bowl. I was, I'm constantly amazed at the leaps that the women's game has made, not just to be, um, I think it's chicken or the egg, right? It's, it's not just now fans are invested in it, but it's a better product. And as a result, it, it, people want to sit and watch the game and spend two and a half hours and they have a rooting interest. Like there was a very clear delineation between LSU fans and Iowa fans. Um, among casuals who have no rooting interest for either campus and maybe have never been to either campus. So I found that I found that really um, interesting and exciting as well, because we talk about growth opportunities like there's still a very high ceiling for women's basketball and where that could end up in this country. I think it's interesting uh, and maybe I'm wrong here, but last year I feel like Iowa's maybe the bad guy after the whole this thing. And this year, I feel like LSU is the bad guy in the in this movie, if it, it were a movie. Yeah. By the way, I explained my 12-year-old daughter is not into sports. And um, the game was on. We're sitting there eating her ice cream. And I explained to her the dynamics in play and kind of the, the everything, right? And not, not the pick-and-roll defense that LSU's got to be worried about with Caitlin Clark 30 feet from the basket. Because she wouldn't get that, but she got the big picture, you know, good versus bad, these versus them. And uh, she looked at me, she goes, oh, so it's just like that, uh, that movie, Bring It On, huh? I was like, yeah, it's <laughs> just like Bring It On. You're exactly right. This is Hollywood. Bring It On instead of Cheer. It's on a basketball court. Um, and there are some really strong personalities to get us to that point. I don't know if you read the Washington Post article on Kim Mulkey, but it was a really, really well-written profile that explains where her competitive edge comes from and why she is the way that she is and how she is. And I thought it was fascinating. I mean, it could have been about, um, in some ways, it could have been about Nick Saban's upbringing in West Virginia. You know, like, this is what made this great coach. And so um, I think all of that plays into, um, plays into why the sport's so popular. Well, so we, at the top of the show, because of K Caitlin Clark, we asked the question, best college basketball player you've ever watched. It can be men or women. 
I'll ask you, who, who's the best that you've actually seen play? Yeah, in person, um, in or, terms of being TV. unstoppable. Well, I, I I think it's much more it's much easier to be impressed by somebody when you see them on person, right? I mean, the two dimensions of television very limiting. Um, I covered Jimmer Fredette back in the day when he was at BYU, and he was unstoppable, and and he was fun to watch, and he would pull up from anywhere. Um, Dalton Connect had a little bit of that this year brandon miller obviously is polarizing with everything else that went on but as a player i mean he won a game in overtime in south carolina where he scored like the last 12 points and they didn't have anyone who could guard him so um there are always better players more dynamic players um but i think the one that can take over a game that can't be guarded um that has that drive that i'm i'm going to have the ball in my hands so i'm going to go score and you can't stop me that's different than oh, that person's fun to watch, you know, or that person's really good and is going to be a first-round pick. I, I think there's a separator there. Yeah, no doubt about it. Do you remember where you were when Steph Curry made his little run there with Davidson? What was that, 03, 04, whenever it was? Yeah, I remember watching that, and um, I, I don't think any of us fully appreciated like that he could do that at the NBA level because the game hadn't changed yet because he changed the game, right? I mean, he changed – the idea of range and he changed the idea of a good shot versus a bad shot. And it happened to come around at the same time that points per possession started to get more appreciation based on, okay, well, listen, a deep three is still better than a mid range two If your shooting percentage is X and the math checked out with Curry, um, it was hard. I think it was a hard to appreciate him at the time as someone who could be that dynamic at the next level because of his size and because of the fact that the game still had regular bigs in it, you know, like guys where you would just feed the post. Uh, that just doesn't, doesn't happen anymore at the NBA level. I was way wrong. Not 04, 05, 09. So I just didn't want to. And that was not that long ago. No, it wasn't that long ago. Hey, so you were traveling. I don't know if you saw, but there was a little scare on social media that Anderson Garcia might go into the portal. He came out and said he's not going to the portal, that he was never considering going in the portal. But you can imagine all of us, after hitting one of the biggest shots in A&M basketball history, yeah. we're a little, we panicked for a few minutes. Well, um, the portal gives and takes, and, yeah. and the freedom that players have these days it, is both good and bad. And you're going to have people um, talking. I don't know where those rumors first came from. I'm not sure. Um but he's, you know, players now have their own, their own media channel where they can put those rumors to rest. I, I found it interesting. It, there's a, a bit of a parallel with uh, all the Angel Reese talk last night um, in the post game from LSU, and they were complaining. The teammates were complaining. Nobody gets her. She's been cast as this villain. And uh, I, I am fascinated by the way regular fans treat 19, 20, 21 year old kids. Um, I was in the hotel lobby in Fayetteville on whatever night that was Friday night and sitting next to me at the bar was a, a woman in her probably mid 40s as LSU's baseball team walked in now she had been over served I'm not I'm not giving her grace I'm just saying that it wasn't worth challenging her on any of this but she starts screaming across the bar go back to Baton Rouge and I'm like <laughs> You would never talk to any 18 or 19 year old like that. But just because they're wearing the uniform of a team you don't like, you feel empowered to do so. So I found that part fascinating. And then I vacillated back to the other side. And, and because I, I do think there's two sides to this in that in this day and age of money that is to be made and, and, um, like these are now, now stars, right? If you're going to star in a national television commercial, um, you are a celebrity, and with celebrity status comes um, invasion of privacy. That is just something that you, for better or for worse, agree to give away when you adopt uh, any level of celebrity status. And so I, I think there's um, it's a hard lesson for kids to learn. Like, hey, I want to be celebrity. I want to have that celebrity status. I want to get paid to show up in commercials. I want to have my rap career. I want to do this, that. And I want to do all of this stuff. Yes, and that popularity comes with a price, and it is a very hard price to learn, um, even for kids who grew up in the showbiz business, right, and, and started it at eight years old. Um, and it can be a, a devastating price to learn, but that's where we are, and that's kind of the, the, 
the property that we've landed on now with all this money that's going to um, student athletes and good for them. But but there's always a cost. Tom, two things can be true. She could have put Angel Reese, I'm speaking of here, put herself in an environment where you kind of invite that kind of hate. But nobody deserves, you know, to be threatened, to say, we're going to kill you and racial overtones. Like none of that should be okay or is okay. Not so two things can be true. She can ask for the spotlight sure. and also not deserve what she gets. 100%. 100%. And, and I hope that she takes the opportunity to, to mentor and to teach the next Angel Reese and say, hey, this is what you need to be prepared for. And, and perhaps it's this is what is fair game. This is what isn't fair game. Th- this is how you can expose yourself. This is how you can protect yourself. Um, I, I know these these their kids i know these kids get you know, some great leadership advice i just feel like it means more coming peer to peer than it does coming from sitting in a conference room and having somebody who you know runs facebook talk to you about the dangers of social media like you don't want to listen to that guy who lives his life in a, in a boardroom you want to listen to a peer it's been through it themselves. No doubt about that. Uh, I do want to ask you about some Aggie baseball in a minute, but uh, Alabama, how has Nate Oates done it, man? This is not the same team from last year, yet here they are, Final Four. No, they're not even the same team really from January or February, and I, I think the biggest difference is Grant Nelson. And I know all the Barkley comments um, threw a lot of ire, especially from Nate himself. Uh, what Barkley said about Grant Nelson not being tough enough was absolutely true on like January 20th. 100% accurate, but he's changed and he's gotten tougher and he's taken on more of a responsibility to be uh, a better low post defender and to be able to be a guy they can go to on the block because as much as they love the threes, they also desperately need layups and he can get them. Mark Sears can get them on drives. Estrada can get them on drives. Um, so I think Nelson's emergence is a guy who's matured within the game since playing at a lower level last year at North Dakota State has been a big key for them. Um, he, he does need to stay out of silly foul trouble. Like, he, he picked up some fouls the other night. He, he reaches in when he shouldn't. He bodies a guy when he shouldn't. Uh, I think that's a tough lesson to be learned. If he can stay out of foul trouble next round, then they'll have an opportunity. He's, he's not their best player, but because he's the only one that gives them that size and opportunity inside, I, I do think he's more valuable than Mark Sears um, because their guards are really good. And they got a lot of guys who can do that. Talking to Tom Hart here on the beach, by the way, on Texax Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Aggie baseball, man. Um, oh, there's that view again. Look at that view. Uh, Aggie baseball, Tom. They are they're getting it done. Obviously, when you when you watch this team play, when you are preparing for a broadcast that they're in, does it start with Brady Montgomery for you, or really, it starts with Schloss, right? Yeah, yeah, because the whole the top third of that lineup is maybe the best top three hitters that we have in college baseball right now. The back end of the bullpen is sensational with Ackenhausen. The uh, I mean, um, Austin Beck. Why did I just call him Ackenhausen? Yeah, so A's with multiple syllables. There's a couple of them. One at LSU, one at A and M. Uh, the A and M guys way better. Um, the question for me, and I think it's a fair question, is all right. How good does the rotation have to be? Um, can you afford to continue to win games ten to eight? 11 to seven, that type of thing. Um, you are who you are at this point. We're halfway through the season, but I, I think, so I think the offense is going to be good enough to take them, you know, as far as they want to go. And there's room for improvement um, from the rotation, the, the top third of the lineup and the bullpen piece. That's something that nobody else has. Right Talking to Tom Hart here on Texas radio presented by David Garner's jewelers. When I watch Braden Montgomery play, man, like I think to myself, this, cause I hate the portal but I love the portal and yeah. he's the reason that I love the portal. <laughs> yeah. You should love the portal. By the way, the, you know, I'm in the Caribbean right now, right? The, the pirates of the Caribbean keeps like coming up as a theme. Uh, the sec has absolutely raided the PAC 12 over the last like three years for a second there. Everybody had a shortstop from the West coast PAC 12 Hawaii that otherwise would have ended up at Arizona or UCLA or Stanford or Cal. And now you go to Stanford, you, grab the, maybe the best hitter in, in college baseball right now. Um, it's, it's another reminder that this is a destination for college baseball players, not just that they get to play in front of, you know, 10 to 15,000 on Friday nights and every game is on TV and 
that level of um, awareness and celebrity comes with it. But 88 SEC players on opening day rosters this week in Major League Baseball, 88, by far and away, more than any other conference. Um, it draws great players. It um, develops those players into big leaguers if they're not already there. Um, and it reinforces what the great players are. So I think it's a, a great move for, for Braden. And I, you're right. I mean, this is it's turned into a super league, you know, whether it's A&M, Arkansas, LSU, especially last year, maybe not as much this year. Um, they're all the Yankees and that they can go out and, and generally, I'm not saying it doesn't take hard work and great coaching and incredible recruiting, but generally pick and choose and get the best players from other spots onto their roster. A quick example, a and the other night had a battery of a catcher and a pitcher, both from Texas Tech. Texas Tech ends up like in Omaha every other year. That's a good, solid, nationally relevant program. And they just go uh, plunk a couple guys and, and bring them to, uh, to Fayetteville. So, yeah, the, the portal, I, you could make a case if you did a, a breakdown study. I think you could make a case that the SEC takes better advantage of the portal in baseball than in any other sport. And that, that includes all the greats that have come through in football. Tom, there was a day, and it wasn't long ago, that a no-hitter really, really mattered. Yesterday, the Astros throw a no-hitter, and it mattered. But, like, do people really care anymore, or is it just because there was so much going on in the sports landscape last night? Because it didn't go as viral, and I didn't even talk about it on this show as much. So, uh, truth three, I had that game on in my hotel last night. For some reason, it was on this Caribbean ESPN2 sports channel. Good channel. It was the Astros broadcast. So I had it on. And I was, and I just had it on because I didn't want to watch the second women's game, and I had to have something on. And I was watching the Astros Blue Jays. I had no idea it was a no hitter. Maybe they never mentioned it. I, I don't know, but it didn't register. And I had it on for like four innings. Now, granted, the Astros. What was the final score? Ten. It was ten nothing when right. I eventually dripped it off. So yeah, th- there was a lot of excitement around the offense. No, I think it. I think it still matters. Um, I just think that it is a very crowded sports landscape right now, especially with the men's and women's final fours and Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and all of that. It was because that was the story of the sports world. Last. I don't remember if you have ever covered a World Series. I mean, excuse me, a no hitter. But if you were in the middle of a broadcast, do you follow the rules that local broadcasters follow or do you do you mention it? No, and, and I don't mean to. Um, be too critical of the Astros broadcast. Maybe they did mention it, but for that reason alone is the reason I mention it. Now you don't mention it in the fifth inning. You may hint at it in the sixth inning, but I've had several, um, I've had several in pro ball. I've had several in the college ranks. Jack Leiter had one for Vandy a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the A&M guy. I had one like six years ago at Bluebell. Um, it was a Kyle Simons maybe had a no hitter against Vanderbilt. So, yeah, I think it is the announcer's job to make the audience aware that something very special is happening because our attention spans are not what they used to be. And if you're, you know, like I was sitting in a hotel room, and you're kind of maybe half asleep or flipping through Instagram or whatever, get my attention and say, hey, listen, this is something very special. You don't have to go into the history of it, but um, let me know. Yeah, he's got a no-hitter through seven. He hasn't allowed a hit through six and two-thirds. It's the eighth inning, and there's a zero in the hit column. Call your friends. Let people be aware. It's a, it can be a communal experience for viewers. That everybody's there in the same moment, even if you're scattered across the country. Um, once again, I don't want to bash the, the Astros guys. Maybe they made people aware. But I feel, first of all, I go by the Vince Scully rule, and Scully used to do it, and he's the best ever. He would say there's a no-hitter, and that was his argument. So that should be enough point blank, period, end of story. If it's good enough for Scully, it's good enough for everybody. Um, But I just go back to the fact that you need to make people aware and never in the history of a game has an announcer ever been able to jinx a game. He can't reach down there and make an umpire call a ball or make a guy throw a strike or have a guy hit the ball out of the ballpark or even connect for a cheap bunt hit to ruin the no-hitter. So your responsibility is to your audience. Tom, it was May 7th, 2016, 3-0 victory over Vanderbilt, the 12th no-hitter in A&M uh, history, the number 12, of course. It took, if I'm not mistaken, an, like an hour and 56 minutes. Vandy went up and swung at every first pitch strike 
I mean, every every first pitch was a strike. They swung at every single one of them. Do you have the time in front of you? Do you know what box score? Uh, it was the fastest game I've ever been a part of. No, I don't have the time here. I'm just looking at an article okay. written. Take take my word for it. It was it was sub two hours. It was a Maddox. It was a masterpiece. It's my favorite kind of baseball game. Sub two hours. Yeah. Appreciate you, Tom. Enjoy the beach. Stay there for longer than two hours, please. I'm going to do my best. Just let it wash over you, okay? Gosh. I'm going to send you some videos later. So jealous, brother. Have fun, man. Talk to you soon. See you, Dave. Later. Tom Hart, SEC Network ESPN here on Tex Ags Radio. We'll hit a break. We'll come back with Around the SEC, this time for reals. Troubadour Festival time, a Texas barbecue and music experience. They return to Texas A&M's Aggie Park on Saturday, May the 18th. This year's event, bigger and better. It's going to be great. You guys, if you went last year, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you didn't, you heard about it. You know it's great out there. They've got uh, 35 of the best barbecue joints in Texas for you to indulge in unlimited samples of their uh, incredible smoke creations. Don't forget about the music, too, because you know who's going to be there. Travis Stritt, he's the headliner. He is incredible. He'll be joined by Texas country legend Pat Green, William Clark Green, the Red Clay Strays, Cameron Sackey Band, and much, much more. So whether you want to experience the barbecue or the concert itself or just the concert, there's a ticket for you, and tickets are on sale at TroubadourFestival.com. That is TroubadourFestival.com. I want you to get your tickets now so you can be there and, and enjoy Aggie Park. Again, that is on Saturday, May the 18th. It is the Troubadour Festival 2024.
Sean's been playing some new songs on the show, right, Nick? I don't think we've heard some of these. He's doing a good job. I, if I, tell me if I'm right. No, if it's Dave Matthews, Dave 100%. Is, okay, okay. Yeah, Mr. Dave Matthews to you. By the way, we you know, Tom Hart said about an hour or two hours on that no-hitter yep. by Kyle Simons. 2.08 is the official time on that. So two I hours. guess that's right on, like you said, right up your alley. Yeah, look, and I love baseball, but I don't want to watch a three-hour baseball game. 2.08 like, is how long, like, seven-inning high school games last. Hmm. So that's a nine-inning high-level college game. I'm trying to think of, like, I think college football, I like three hours. I don't want it to go necessarily go longer than three hours. NFL, two and a half to three hours sounds good to me. Like, I don't know, just like to commit more than two and a half hours to things at this point in my life, like that's like watching The Godfather. Who's got yeah. time to watch three hours now? Yeah, I'm all right with like three and a half hour football games because that's what they're typically three and a half, four hours now yeah. with all the commercials. But I'm all right with that. Baseball's like two and a half to three is what I expect, and that's fine. Basketball's pretty quick, so. So always like that. I watched a couple of movies this weekend that I wish I got my time back, and I already mentioned one of them. <laughs> that Roadhouse movie, I had to watch it because I like MMA and I like Jake Gyllenhaal and I like Conor McGregor. It was atrocious. Hmm. Have you watched it? No, and I I won't be. No. The they had CGI fighting for some reason. You don't need to do CGI. It was fighting. like Jake Gyllenhaal fighting Conor McGregor, but it was fake instead of like um, stuntmen. I think their fighting might have not been. C there were a couple different CGI parts that were just like I didn't understand why they did mm -hmm. it. Uh, but it was it was two hours and nine minutes, whatever it was that I'll never watch a a, a no hitter from Kyle Simons at that same time. Hundred percent. Than that, I also watched The Beekeeper. Are you familiar with The no. Beekeeper? No, oh, don't. What is that about? Jason Statham. They're all the same movie, right? And it was just, it was an option. All right, we'll watch it. It was so, when I say bad, like, it is, it was so bad. It, the writing, the acting, the whole thing, like, it hurts my stomach thinking about it right now. Do not watch the, be well, no, watch the beekeeper. Just, and then make fun of it? And then make fun of it. Okay, yeah. yeah. Those are bad. If any of you all have seen those movies, Roadhouse, I mean, Jake Gyllenhaal's a big-time actor. He was remaking a really good movie, and they never remake movies good, so I should have known. I, I want to address this before we do around the SEC. Frank Mason says, David Nuno, I heard rumors again about A&M going to the Big Ten. Are you hearing anything? A couple things. I saw that rumor yesterday. What day was yesterday, Nick? April Fools. Okay. I have not heard. I've only, let, me, let me say this again. Frank, and I, I'm, I'm not meaning this in a mean way. Please don't take it that way. What reputable person has reported that? Like if there's, who are some of the reputable names? Pete Thamel, even though I don't necessarily love him. Um, who else? Paul Feinbaum, is he reputable? I guess he'd be reputable if he yeah. reported this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Greg McElroy. I'm just thinking of people's names that would be reputable. Ross Dellinger. Ross Del Dellinger, right? He absolutely, he's one of the top guys out there. Even Adrian Wojnarowski, Adam Schefter in different sports, right? One of those guys reports it. Or Billy Lucci, excuse me. Like, Let's start with one of the first guys that I just made up the name, but it was something like that. Frank the Tank in Missouri, who initially reported it. His name was, I think it's Greg, actually. Greg Schwami, I think it was. Yeah, he's a volume shooter if you look yeah. at his Twitter account. Just constantly shooting, right? He's just constantly shooting. He's constantly shooting. So to me, it, where does it, and if you look at his Twitter account, he's wrong a lot, a lot, right? I haven't heard of that rumor. It doesn't make sense to me at all. Especially with, we don't know the direction. Is it the SEC and the Big Ten are going to basically combine forces at some point and make a Super League? Who knows, right? No, I don't buy it, Frank. I don't believe it. Um, and until a reputable name reports something, I don't buy stuff that I read on the internet, except I, I did believe Justin Reed yesterday when he said he was retiring. Other than that, um, and Frank, I, I get it, because I saw it too. Like yesterday, I had a pause. Every little report out there, like, what? what? There's always a pause. And they'll make a fake account that looks like Billy Lucci. It's Billy Lachi, right? And you're like, oh, Billy Lachi is reporting that a and going to the Big Ten. No, they're not. Uh, so, uh, but I, I feel you, Frank. I don't think it's true. In fact, it's not true. How about that? I don't There's no thinking. I'm taking it out. Taking out the think, throwing it away. Not true. Let's do this since I went too long. We're going to go to Cali in a moment. We'll go to Cali. We'll get around the SEC. Plus, we've got uh, Nick's got some football questions to ask. So, we'll get into that. And uh, your text messages at 979-693-1150. It's Tech Sags Radio.
Hey, it's Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. I want Callie and Nick to participate in this, in this conversation. So I, I read, the, so Tom Hart mentioned he will say if it's a no-hitter on a national broadcast, okay? And Tamu Working Ag says, sorry, it's even bad to mention a no-hitter in any way. You're wrong, dude. I believe in a jinx, sorry, and a lot of people do. Wrong again, dude. I think he's talking to Tom, not me. So how do you guys feel about this? I just, I kind of want a group discussion. Like, uh, you know, let's have a think tank going here. Nick, I'm with Tom. You? I'm 100% with Tom. Tom this, Hart? Yes, Tom Hart, especially with what he said at the end. Like, nothing a broadcaster has ever said causes a pitcher to throw a ball or throw a strike or give a, a hit or this or that. So I'm, I'm with Tom Hart on that one. Okay. Callie? I, I kind of agree. I think... You know, the pitchers, they can't hear what the broadcasters are saying. And if anybody is going to... But the fans can, and they're the ones who blame. Yeah, that's true. But if anyone's going to psych themselves out over that, it's going to be like the pitcher himself. And he knows that he's got a no-hitter so far through any point in a game. Um, so I don't think anything the, the announcer says has anything to do with it. But I will say, if I was a fan of the team that was currently throwing the no-hitter... And it was broken. Someone got a hit. I probably would 100 percent blame it on the announcer. So a couple things about that. Have you all ever moved from a seat that you're sitting in because you think it affects the game? I have. Have no. you? I've done it at home. I've never like got up in a stadium and moved, but at home, I for sure have. Have you ever worn a lucky shirt for a team that you're? You yes, know? I wore the same jersey at the World Series all that two years ago. Nick? No. Apparently, I'm like. The yeah. anti-superstition yeah. guy here. <laughs> Let me guess. You would probably arrest Santa Claus if he broke into your house and brought gifts? Uh, might. Yo, no, 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 no. no, no. You're, you're Glock no. Nick. Yeah, Never we're mind. not going there. <laughs> skip, skip, <laughs> skip. Skip my answer. Yeah. So my point is I get the conversation because I do stupid things. I remember like during the, the Rockets championship days, like, hey, it's not working. I've got to switch uh, the channel I'm listening on or watching on or where I'm sitting. But it has no effect. I remember, Nick, you'll remember this. Last year on this exact show, I brought up a stat about Aggie baseball to Jim Schlossnagel, our, our, our fearless leader there for Aggie baseball. And then the next game, the thing that I brought up was snapped. I don't remember what I brought up, but I was thinking. I, re- I do remember You that. remember that? And yeah. I felt like such an idiot. Like it was my fault. It wasn't my fault. But I felt that way. Uh, and it's kind of like... Um, there's one, I lost a listener this year. I don't know if you remember. I've lost many over the years. But I, will, I lost one in particular because I predicted for Tennessee to beat Texas A&M. Okay? Because A&M hadn't won on the road since Lyndon B. Johnson was the president. Right? Yep. I predicted that. And he sent me a, a, a Twitter message, whatever. I feel like I'm 86 talking right now. And he's like, you're not a real Aggie. How dare you pick Tennessee to win? Rrr. I th- I just, Pretty sure you weren't the only one to pick no. up that week who works within the walls of this, you know. But anyways, continue. And then when they lost, look what you did. What did I do? I didn't do anything. I just predicted them to lose because they hadn't won on the road, but I won on the win. I always won on the win. So my point is we don't have that power, but it is an easy thing to point at. Now, if you really believe, like, how dare you bring up the no-hitter at our breakfast or our, well, not breakfast, baseball's not going on at breakfast, at our dinner while the game's going on. You cost us that game. I don't believe that happens. But I, I also, do, if I did a local broadcast, I pro, if you do the local broadcast, you're hired by the team typically, right? They, I think yeah. they pay your, so I think in that case, I probably wouldn't say it. If you're a national broadcast, you got to tell the story. Fair enough, yeah. And I don't think, uh, I was watching the game last night and he mentioned that the Astros broadcast didn't bring it up. I'm pretty sure that's correct. He they were very, you know, vague about it, but, you know, hinted at it. So I understand that side of it, I guess. If you're watching, you know, what, it, what is it, Space City Home Network now, you want yeah. the Astros side. But if you're watching the, the Blue Jays, you know, hey, well, he's, oh, he still hadn't given up a hit. Oh, it's no hitter. Hey. No hitter still going on, you know, because you want them to jinx it. But uh, a- absolutely, if you're calling the game for ESPN, for Fox Sports, whatever, you you should mention it. And by the way, you want... As a TV station, you want the viewers. You don't necessarily care about the outcome of the game. You don't have a vested interest in it. At least you shouldn't, right? What happens, it didn't happen last night that, I, I, that I'm aware of, but what happens typically when there's a no-hitter in the eighth and ninth inning? Two mm. things happen. Yeah. 
the bottom line on different channels that that company owns. Hey, tune into ESPN mm-hmm. News right now as Bobby Johnson is throwing a no hitter. Or you get an alert from your ESPN yep, app to 100%. tell you it's happening. That's what I was about to say. I got one. Uh, Ron L. Blanco is one out away or two outs away in the ninth inning. Did you get Tune that? In. Okay. I did. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I did. S- I didn't get that. I got the one that said that he got it. I didn't get that one, which was interesting. All right. I've not. I've wasted enough time on that. If you want to weigh in on it, nine seven nine six nine three eleven fifty. We go back to the angry elephant news in Social Center. Cali Gardner is there. Galita, as I, I like to affectionately call her, <laughs> Galita. Uh, you've got around the SEC for us. I do. Uh, we'll start with baseball since we're just on that track right now. Uh, Braden Montgomery was named SEC Player of the Week after his performance against Auburn. It was just super impressive. He batted 500 with four, four home runs, seven RBIs, and eight runs scored. Aggie Baseball moved up to number three in the D1 baseball rankings after another 4 0 week to improve to 25 and 3 on the season, the best record in college baseball right now, which, I mean, if we're talking about jinx, I might have just jinxed this, but you know. Uh, they'll travel to San Marcos tonight for a midweek battle with Texas State at 6 o'clock. Uh, there are 10 SEC teams in the top 25 of D1 baseball rankings, and the SEC holds five of the top seven. Clemson is the only team that is not in the SEC that's in the top four, and they traveled to Notre Dame this weekend for a road series against the Fighting Irish. Uh, we're three weeks into SEC play, and Kentucky is 8-1. and one. They are not a team I had uh, predicted to be up there, much less at the very top of the SEC East. Uh, This weekend was the first time ever in Kentucky baseball history that they swept Ole Miss, which is really impressive for them. Their uh, current wins, they have swept Georgia and Ole Miss, and they took two from Missouri, and they'll host Alabama this weekend and travel to Auburn next weekend, so maybe we'll get a little bit of a better idea of who Kentucky is as a baseball team uh, over the next two weekends. Uh, Florida's last midweek win, I know we talked about this a little bit ago in the show, but their last midweek win was February 28th, Uh, so they did not win a midweek game in March. Um, and they've also won all three SEC series. So they're kind of walking that line of uh, winning the games that matter. But then, you know, when it comes down to uh, selection for regional hosts and super regional hosts, they do look at those midweek games. Um, So Florida is going to have to change something. Uh, Speaking of Florida, Wyatt Langford made his MLB debut with the Rangers on Thursday. And over the weekend, he had five hits and three RBIs. And he had a really impressive hustle play. Uh, He was actually out at home, but he ran all the way from first to home on a single, uh, and he was, it was a really close play, and I just was really impressed by his um, hustle as a as a rookie in the MLB, and an LSU player, Josh Smith, who also plays for the Rangers, um, has come in as a pinch hitter and probably in place for a long time um, at third base for Josh Young, who played at Tech. Uh, he broke his wrist, or fractured his wrist um, last night in the game, uh, got hit by a pitch, and he will be out for a while. Um, Aggie softball hosts Prairie View A&M tonight um, at 6 o'clock, and they are 28-7 and seven on the year. They just lost a really tough series on the road to LSU, um, but they put up a couple couple good fights in those games. Um, they got walked off in one of them, and they had the lead in the other and just couldn't get it done, but LSU is a good team. Uh, so we're, we look forward to seeing them back in action as they host Kentucky at Davis Diamond this weekend. Uh, so if you're in town, go out and show your support for them. a and soccer standout Shea O'Rourke is headed to Germany with the U-20 national team. Uh, trip is in preparation for the U-20 World Cup. And so good luck to Shea and her USA teammates this week as they play Germany on Friday and Canada on Sunday. a and Equestrian fell to number three Auburn this weekend in the SEC Equestrian Championships, but they were the top seed going in. Um, and they hosted it in College Station. So, Good stuff there. Um, I didn't re- realize how hot button of an issue this is about the superstitions. I'm going to read this question from Glenn and Brian. So the SI cover, is it real? I'll ask you too. What do you think? Do you even know what an SI is, by the way? Carlita? I don't. Okay. Sports Illustrated. Used oh, to be a oh, magazine, okay. which... I see now. Yes. Yeah, got me. Yes, yes, yes. Nick, are you familiar with Sports Illustrated? SI? Yes, I am. Okay. Is that curse real? Uh... Uh, to be c- quite honest, I'm not familiar with the. Is that like being on the cover in your it, curse? And bad things happen. So some like something like the the Madden cover curse. Correct. The, the which, game. by okay. the way, is fake for the record. But we can we can kind of go through that. But there's examples of people. Um, 2019, Bryce Harper was on the cover, um, and uh, not only did the, Finney, the Phillies finish with a 500 record, and they missed the playoffs. His former team, the uh, the Nationals, won the World Series that year. Don't remind me. I was there for that. Uh, 2018, men's basketball tournament, Virginia Cavaliers, forward Isaiah Wilkins. However, the Cavaliers would become the first number one seed team to lose to the 16 seed. So there are certainly examples of when it didn't work, um, when it did work. But 
Do you remember who was on the cover of uh, Sports Illustrated in 2014? George Springer. And what did it say? Your 2017 World Series champions. Or did year, it, did what, it say the date or the, the I year? think it said the 2017 World Series. Yeah, yeah, Alex tells me they were. it said 2017 on it. So, so yeah. that was a particular case where the SI curse did not work. The Astros won the World Series exactly three years later. The author of that article, if I remember correctly, also did the podcast recently breaking down the Astros cheating scandal. I can't remember his name at the moment. I've interviewed him before, but... Same same author. So uh, he followed that story from the very beginning. Contradictions to the SI curse. I found this on Wikipedia. I assume it's correct. Vince Young um, was on the cover of Sports Illustrated tr- twice during the Texas National Championship season. I mean, they shouldn't put him on, and things would have been different. Emma Smith appeared on the cover for the Cowboys when they won the Super their first Super Bowl. And obviously, I mentioned the Astros one from 2014. So there are examples of when it doesn't necessarily take place. I don't believe... I, I like to believe in superstitions in the moment, but I don't really believe them. Like, it just makes me feel like I'm doing my part as a fan. But the reality is I have no... You know how you do your part as a fan? You clap really loud. You, you, you give them the momentum that they need in the stadium. At home, I don't think you're really helping. You're, I mean, they know you're rooting for them, but I don't think it makes a difference. And do we agree with this? I think that was a perfect way to put it. I think, I think superstitions definitely make me feel like I'm contributing to the betterment of the team as a fan. But, I mean, the second it doesn't work, I'll, I'll be like, you know what? It wasn't real. To it wasn't real, yeah. Kyle Salmon, not Simons, Kyle si- Salmon tweeting or texting the show, I don't believe in superstitions, but it does work. So see, we all feel like we play a role. Let's do this. We're going to hit a break. When we come back on Tech Radio, we will do Double Days. I haven't forgotten. And Nick's going to ask me some football questions. We'll get into that next on Tech Radio.
Final segment of the program here on Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studios. Time to end the day with Double Days. Our good friends at Double Days. Caller number 12. 979-693-1150. We're going to hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's, serving Aggie Land since 1984. They've got your favorite pizza and, of course, your favorite pepperoni rolls with reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDave's.com, and your favorites are going to be on their way. Nick, as we uh, get ready for the spring game here in a couple weeks, uh, I know you have some football questions you, you've been thinking about you want to throw my way. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, just thinking about the new install of the of Col- Coach Klein's offense, uh, Jay Bateman's defense with, you know, Mike Elko sprinkled here and there, I'm sure. Like, what what are you most ex- – or I guess which players are you most excited to watch in the new-look offense and the new-look defense? So I'll let you, I guess, start with the offense, and, and we'll see what you think there. Well, I'm going to take this in parts. The first one I'm going to say has nothing to do with the scheme per se – but I am, I'm, God, I'm such a nerd for saying this out loud. And I'm not saying this just to be different, but I'm, I'm really interested in the offensive line because I just think that is what is going to make a difference this year. And yeah, scheme plays a part in how the offensive lines, how they're coached. But like, if you're asking me like where I'm putting my money, I already know Connor Wigman is going to be good in whatever offense you put him in, right? I know that. So I am very interested in seeing what the offensive line does in this new system slash coaching philosophy with Adam Cushing there. That's, that's kind of where, and I don't want to say it's like, I'm going to be watching every second of it. Like I would watch like a big offensive touchdown, but I, that's where my start is. Like does Bryce Foster get back to what we're used to seeing or what we expected to see after his freshman year? Does Ruben Fathery, where does Chase Basantis go? Right. So the non-sexy answer is I want to start there, but if you're actually asking for specifics, right? How do you not wonder what, what Connor's going to look like with this kind of play calling? Because I remember the feeling last year where we could tell the offense was different, but it still felt at times like certain games were like, is Jimbo calling the plays? I know it's Bobby Petrino's offense, but is it? Or is it Bobby Petrino calling Jimbo's plays? New regime, new system. So I'm excited about what Colin's gonna, excuse me, Connor's going to look like in Colin's, Colin's system. Goodness, too many C's for me. So that's, that's, that's one part of it. Uh, I'd like to see Moose Muhammad and what he's able to do if he is the alpha of the receivers, right? If he takes that big step and gets the playmaking that we expect him to get. Because without Anaya Smith, somebody's going to have to be Mr. Dependable. Is it him? Is it one of the newcomers? Cyrus Allen, Jabari Barber. Is it uh, Noah Thomas putting on a little bit more size and a little bit more confidence to go along with that? But for me, my eyes are going to be on the line Connor, obviously, staying healthy and getting the ball out there. So that, that's the easy one. If you look at the, uh, the freshman, I'm trying to look at the list here. Terry Bussey, what role is he going to play offensively if he plays one at all? Like, I'm super excited about seeing him. No doubt about that. Um, you know, you've got the, uh, the, uh, the kids from Florida, Isaiah Williams and Kendall Jackson. Obviously, I'm interested in seeing what they do there. Alpha Bethel Roman, all interesting names. But to me, it starts with a line. And then you advance to Connor. And then who's going to be his playmaker? And we already know what kind of playmaker Moose is. So if Moose is able to do that on a consistent label, uh, level. Now, if Cyrus Allen lives up to what I think he might live up to, this could be really fun. And I'm really excited about seeing that. Defensively, how do you not think about Nick Scorton, right? Like, led the Big Ten in sacks, comes here, and... Look, we, we need a consistent pass rusher. And if he's going to be that guy with Coach Elko coaching him, yo, right? Like, I'm excited about that. No doubt about that. He's not the only one. I, I, I'm curious what Scooby is going to look like in this system. I'd like to see uh, what Torian York is in year two as the guy. Because last year, we, Billy was giving us little ideas that he could be the guy. And I think Billy was the first one to say, this guy, I think, might start. And when he started, and he started living up to what we had heard and what we had seen a little bit. Like That's when things started to feel way different, right? But how does he look in year two? Absolutely interested in how he looks in year two. So you do that. You go along with some of the freshmen. And I think you're in a really good spot, guys. Like I, I, I do. When you look at what they have coming back defensively, like again, who else is going to provide a pass rush? Is it going to come internally? Shamar Turner? Like... Shamar Turner and Shamar Stewart, the, both of those guys. Like, 
we know how good they are and how good Shamar, especially Stewart, finished the season last year. Where are they under Coach Elko's coaching, right? And Jay Bateman, where are they going? So I can point at a lot of different names I think we'll all be excited about. But it starts with the offensive line for me and the defensive line. Like, to me, that's where it starts. I will say, Des Ricks, super excited to see what he becomes uh, because I think he can be a guy. Uh, abs- I mean, there's a reason he didn't play a lot at Alabama last year. It wasn't an ability. It was that they, had, they were loaded back there, and they could wait. I don't know if A&M could wait. You know, Tyreek Chappelle is back. Will Lee is, is here now. Uh, but it's going to be very interesting to see how that all plays out. All right. A couple things. We had a fun show today. We had some fun at Conor McGregor and Jake Gyllenhaal's expense, superstitions. But we had some really good content as well. Shereen Williams, as always, was great. OB, top of the program, was really, really good. Brian Corton got us ready for the Aggie invitation, of course, what they're going to do in postseason play. Uh, we had Aggies in the UFL. Chris Phillips, SEC Unfiltered. I enjoyed that conversation because I, I felt like he was almost interviewing me on the show that I host. And I, and I liked kind of switching roles there. That was fun. Tom Hart on the beach made me jealous. He was excellent. Callie taking over for a uh, throwing out Luke Evangelist. Good job, Callie. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to mention really fast. Oh, A&M, yeah. A&M has a free uh, soccer game tonight, a spring game I'm at Ellis Field. They host Texas Southern tonight at 8 o'clock. So 8 o'clock, uh, get out Ellis there Field, and watch. go support. They're looking good this spring. Yeah. Coach G's our guy. Love Absolutely. him. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, that's going to do it for Texas Ags Radio on a Tuesday. Tomorrow on the program, John Harris, Ryan Broniger, and much, much more. What that more is, I haven't actually updated the sheet yet. But once I do, you'll know because Callie will send an email to uh, Brian Broadcasting and we'll tweet about it tomorrow. All that and more. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you manana.